Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with some special guests, Joe Green, Joseph McBride, Joe, um, and Richard Bartholomew. It's a pleasure to have you guys on the show. Um, I wanted to put this panel together because between all my individual discussions with you guys, um, they could have went on for hours. Uh, we covered the JFK topic and different aspects of it as well, too. But one central theme that I came to the, the conclusion to was the matter of what we would call deep um, state, I would say, I mean, I, that word gets hijacked in so many different meanings now, but an overall power that seems to have overtaken multiple aspects more than probably what it should. And that is the central intelligence agency. That is FBI, whatever you want to say. Um, the secret aspects of things that seem like they have a lot more power than they necessarily lead on to the general public to have. And I think through my conversations with you guys, we've alluded to it, um, multiple times, but also one key key event that is a proper distinction where you get to see literally the track of progress um, from that moment is the JFK assassination. Um, whether you want to lead it back to why he was assassinated, the events prior to that as well too. But that main core issue being the assassination is if the government uh, plotted or planned to kill JFK and they did it, they were successful at what they did. And the reason why I say successful, as much as people could say, well, there's this and there's this, we still don't have an answer, a definitive conclusion on it. And there's still documents that are left to be given to the general public. And, and if, you, if this is all true, if this all is the government's plan of everything, um, I'm saying this just for anybody out there listening that doesn't believe that, um, then this can also be a panel to make a case for why it is these deep politics or it is these powerful forces in there as well too so i turn the floor over to whoever feels like they want to address maybe what is a, a good starting point to as an example of why you could easily point fingers and say that this was a government um designed thing uh, as you say it was hijacked uh, the term was hijacked by the right wing recently which confuses people but peter dale scott really uh formulated that the best way he's a very distinguished historian he wrote a terrific book about deep politics and the death of john f kennedy and he goes into the texas politics and the right wing in texas and the connections with the federal government and military industrial complex uh you know texas uh benefited greatly from the expansion of the Vietnam War. When Kennedy was killed, Johnson ex expanded the war and uh, Bell Helicopter, General Dynamics, other companies profited uh, mightily from that. Um, I, I think of, even before that, there's a book by Gary Wills called Bomb Power, which hasn't been talked about a lot, but it's a very interesting book. And he has the thesis that when the atomic bomb was uh, uh, used by the United States, it changed the nature of our democracy because uh, the president, in effect, became a king at that point because one one person can destroy the world, a drop a bomb or use a tactical nuclear weapon. And uh, we use two of them and uh, it, it's changed the whole nature of the presidency uh, to give one man that amazing power, you know. Uh, but then the question is, does the president really control things too and that's another big issue i'll, I'll pass it on to my friends here you know. that's an interesting to... point you raise um oh go, go ahead no i want to hear i want to hear what you say i was just i, <laughs> I was, was just gonna, gonna say, say deep state so we we use that as the title of my book. joe published my book by the way he's the publisher of my book and uh we collaborated on uh things like the title and and we we went with the deep state in the heart of Texas um, because it's you know a play on deep in the heart of Texas. But also when we were using it, it was still it had not been attacked. It had not been bastardized yet. It was the Trump forces, the right wing that 
well, whoever did it, they 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 do things like that all the time with with phrases because it was such a good phrase. It's it's short, it's catchy, and it's much better than national security state or military industrial complex because you break those down. National is a good word to most people. Security is a good word to most people. State's a good word to most people. But deep state, sinister implications. And I like it and it's catchy and it's short and it says it all. And that's why they had to, you know, twist it around to uh, to make it unusable. But I'm gonna stick to it because that's why. Yeah, there's a, I, I, there's a great essay by George Orwell, Classic Politics in the English Language, uh, which is on, on the internet. You can read it and it's it's great. It's about how words control things in many ways, the, what, the discourse. And, uh, uh, you know, when Trump uses it, 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 for example, fake news, he popularized that term. But I, I think the, the worst purveyors of the fake, fake news in America are the New York Times and the Washington Post who I uh, sent around in my recent book, Political Truth, the media and the assassination of President Kennedy, because they've been, the mainstream media have been lying to us since 63 when we had a, a successful coup, removing the president and changing our policy in Vietnam and other places. And uh, nobody will admit that in the mainstream media, but they've come around now to admitting it in uh, the Trump attempted a coup. And one of the things I, I talked about in my book is how in, in the weeks and months after January 6, 2021, there was a great reluctance in the media to call it a coup. Uh, they tried to downplay it to a riot or, a, a, you know, insurrection, which are, you know, insurrection is pretty bad. But riot is kind of minimizing it. I thought the next stage would be calling it a tailgate party that got out of hand, you know. And I mean, actually, one what was it? one Republican congressman called it a stroll through the Capitol grounds or something like that. Uh, but that's the language is how we define these things. But now they started to call it a coup. And it was General Mark Milley who, who held the line against Trump to some extent. Um, who started uh, uh, describing it as a coup. He didn't actually use that word, but the, the language he was using made it clear that Trump was trying to use the military to, to seize power. And, and then the, the media started thinking, okay, we can call it a coup. They, it legitimated uh, that word, but they still won't admit we had a coup in 63. So I, I think that you know the ignorance or the denial of history is a big part of our problem as a country. I mean, we've, and this is, it's it, you know it's gotten worse since 63 that's when i think the whole schism between two visions of reality you know the reality based community is one of um uh, trump's people called it and then the the rest of the people who believe in delusional thinking uh is a very severe problem but i a lot of people think it started with vietnam when we were lied to by johnson systematically but it, it before that the Kennedy assassination was, we were lied to and the public, most of the public saw through that, you know, they were smarter, or at least they were then, than the, than the media gave them credit for. But um, our whole history has been uh, based on a lot of myths and lies. And, and that's, uh, uh, right now we're seeing the, the really serious effects of all that uh, once again. Well, I, I like that you said the serious effects of all that, because I don't think this is just the same thing that keeps on going on throughout history. I think this is what happens when you've just piled in a bunch of information and you've got people so divided in between each other. I mean, this you can consider this one of the best social experiments out there. The fact that you have people that immediately turn from the main core issue, which is a government passing of something, and they start divided uh, amongst each other. They start fighting in small groups or fighting, fighting in whatever that can't get to the core issue. It's distracting from the main problem. I mean, to me, that's the best social experiment ever. I mean, if we look at examining language, for instance, quarantine and lockdown. Those are the same exact results, but one seen as a good person and one seen as like you're in prison in a sense. They did the same word with conspiracy theory. I think, uh, uh, oh God, Richard, uh, Rich gave it to me the best, which was the aspect of conspiracy theory. We need to hide. We need to take that word back. There's a difference between literal legal language of conspiring to do something. And then there's what people call fantasy. 
And that is a hundred percent true people that will, it, it seems like sometimes when people go by like the official statement of what the government says, I'm like, have you looked in their history books? And it's just like, are these people fake? Are they like getting paid money? I have no clue, but it really makes the problem even bigger when you start realizing that this experiment, which I would call this whole long history of whatever an experiment, because you've got it to the point where people are fighting amongst each other, whether it's political, whether it's this, it's the smallest issues. You can't, we can't even talk about climate change without freaking politics being brought in. Like that's a very, very core issue. And that is something that I, I don't know if it's just ingrained and all of us, we all have very strong opinions about things. Is it social media? Is it this? Or is it the best tactic if you're the government and you're thinking about ways that you can do things without people looking into it because you can easily distract them or manipulate them as such? And what you're experiencing now is people with trust issues, people trying to have trust again, and they're conflicting. Because there are people that don't want to be duped again. And there's people that saying, well, I can't see it in this. And it's true. There are some things that conspiracies, I just can't see. My brain can't get me there to believe it. But there's other things where I'm like, how do you not see this? And then when you come at it at that angle, like you're so shocked that someone else doesn't see it, you can't form your words properly. You can't make a literate sentence where people just look at you like you sound insane. And when you see one conspiracy and you dive down the rabbit hole of what that is, you see them everywhere. And then it gets very, very difficult to distinguish what is true and what is not. And there are things that you should question in this world. I think you need to question your government because I think for the longest time, they've gotten away with their abuse of power. And we know this with JFK, where the CIA was just so used to getting their way, they weren't expecting when somebody said no. And that's not how they were functioning. That's not how they had been rolling. And I think that this is leaked into multiple aspects, not only of our government, but also factors in society too. We have unhealthy relationships with businesses, big tech, whatever you want to say, and government. We have issues with pharmaceutical companies, big tech, and academia. We have a lot of core issues, relationships that have been formed, and I don't know necessarily how we got those relationships to form in the first place. That is my opinion. Well, the term cons cons conspiracy theory was uh, promoted by the CIA in 67 in a memo, which came out years later, but they, they were saying, let's spread this uh, term uh, and this concept uh, through our media elite context, they had many, many contacts in the government. I mean, in the media, the media are kind of a, an arm of the government. Uh, Carl Bernstein wrote a great piece that you can read online. The CIA and the media it was in Rolling Stone in 1977. And he said there were about 400 members of the mainstream media who were working for the CIA in one capacity or another. He said the biggest culprits were the New York Times, um, CBS and Time Incorporated, Time Life. Uh, he kind of shied away from his own Washington Post newspaper, which is kind of a front for the CIA, but uh, uh, they, they made it a term of opprobrium. And uh, uh, it, it, for a long time, it was applied mostly to people who were Kennedy assassination researchers or who were uh, blaming the CIA for things. But uh, recently, it's become an all-purpose term. You read it all the time. And it's kind of lost its meaning. It, it, I, I thought for quite a long time it was devised as a way of shutting down discourse. If you, if you're talking to somebody, and you say, you know, do you think JFK was uh, killed in a military coup? They'll say, well, that's a conspiracy theory. That's supposed to shut down discourse. But in recent years, uh, it, it becomes malleable. Almost anything that is contrary to the official line uh, in papers like the Washington Post and the New York Times is called a conspiracy theory, where, whether it's QAnon or Trump's big lie about the election or whatever, but they, they lump in those things with true conspiracy. I mean, like, for example, Watergate is obviously a conspiracy, and I think that helped people understand, oh, okay, here's a conspiracy. But, there, you know, conspiracies are very common. It just means two people working in conjunction to, to do something illegal, usually covertly and we've had so many in our history uh but the term has been twisted and and twisted out of shape but it still uses as a, a slur against people like us and it's it's a reference to something it's a synonym with fantasy 
they say that's a conspiracy theory, meaning it's not real. You're believing in something not real. Well, the real word for that is fantasy. And like you said, it's Orwellian. Words matter. Conspiracies are real. Fantasies are not real. So we need to take back our words. And I think you're, you're correctly identifying, and I, and I think the thing that, that all researchers would agree on is that the reason we keep talking about the Kennedy assassination is because it's the crucible of modern history in the United States. A lot of the things that we're talking about come about as a result of the fact that the state killed the president and then subsequently had to cover it up and then in the process of doing so uh, used its various powers and outlets to cover up meaning in the media and everywhere else. And this change in language, uh, how things are investigated, what words are allowed to be said publicly. Um, you know, you have to get rid of all conspiracies if conspiracy thinking can lead you to understanding what actually happened in Kennedy assassination. So yeah, I, was talking, comes, I was talking to somebody. Subtle, oh, sorry. Go ahead. There's a more subtle um, linguistic um, thing going on with that, too. The Warren the Warren Commission had two theories, Oswald acted alone and conspiracy. So when people start saying um, with JFK conspiracy theories, plural, I like to correct them on that because that's part of the, you know, changing of the language to say conspiracy theories, plural. And then they break down the breakdown of, you know, mafia, CIA and various other you know, aspects. Those are those are um, aspects of the conspiracy. So there was only two theories: Oswald acted alone and the conspiracy theory. In the Warren Report, there's a chapter called "Investigation of Conspiracy Theory," and the conclusion was that there was evidence of a conspiracy. They just chose not to believe it. I was talking um, to somebody who believes the official version of 9-11, which is preposterous that, you know, allegedly 19 hijackers, you know, as Gore Vidal said, the smoking gun of 9-11 was the idea that 19 guys armed with box cutters could shut down the air defense system in the United States, which is totally absurd. But um, this person, I, I, I was espousing the official line. I said, well, uh, you know, you're a conspiracy theorist. I was kind of needling her about that. And she said, no, I'm not. And I said, well, 19 guys supposedly had a conspiracy. They, they acted in concert to uh, to do this. And she said, oh, well, yeah, OK. Right. And I said, well, that's a conspiracy, isn't it? And she said, oh, uh, well, I guess so. But, uh, you know, it, it, that helped me define conspiracy theory basically means a, a, a theory I don't like of the government, you know, when somebody's talking like, uh, oh, we couldn't have a government that would kill its president, but it happens in other countries. And then the whole thing of American exceptionalism, you keep still hearing that it's harder and harder to s sustain that because we're so far behind other countries in things like infant mortality and uh, other, you know, we've never had a woman president or, you know, things like that. And, um, but uh, when, when you talk about American exceptionalism, it, it, people think it can't happen here, as, as Sinclair Lewis wrote in his satirical novel in 1935, which has gotten a lot of attention because it's about a coup in, in the government. And, uh, you know, it, it's prophetic. So the, people have been warning us about these things for a long time, but the mainstream media are, are the, 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 the barrier to understanding these things. And, and I've always longed for the day when Dan Rather would get up on CBS TV and say, uh, OK, folks, I'll tell you the true story. It's like Red Fox. Red Fox said in the 60s in one of his nightclub routines, he said, you know, in about 50 years, there'll be black people doing commercials on TV and they'll hold up a can of something and say, no shit, folks. You know, and that's kind of what I thought. I'd like to hear Dan Rather do that. But he's, uh, you know, he just can't back down. And part of it was, as Oliver Stone said, they blew the story from day one. The media are not good at criticizing themselves. They, you know, they'll criticize other institutions, but they, they really hate it when people turn the lens on them. And um, they just, uh, very few media people have uh, admitted um, that we, we blew it. Tom Wicker, for example, the New York Times guy, he was in Dallas. He wrote the main story 
for the paper the next day and um, the headline said sniper kills president you know uh, the headline said sniper singular but in the story he says he, he mentions the press conference with the two doctors uh, clark and uh, perry who said that kennedy was shot in the throat and from behind and um uh you know that contradicted the the thrust of the story but the rest of the story said kennedy was shot from a sniper from a building and and that hardened into the official story but you know wicker was kind of haunted by that fact and I'll, um, Norman Mailer said to him once at a party in New York, he said, I, I get the feeling that you, you, you believe that a lot would be lost if you, if you turned to conspiracy, you know? And uh, there was one point where Tom Wicker flirted with saying, well, you know, the story doesn't quite hold up. And then he, then he re retreated and he became one of the big attackers of Oliver Stone for giving an alternate version of history, which, you know, the irony of Oliver Stone's JFK is that it's a, a, quite an accurate film, I think, in terms of its portrayal of what happened. Uh, you could quibble about a few things, but, um, you know, people said it was a false uh, fantasy, but actually it's it's a, almost like a, a, I mean, it's a very well-researched docudrama. Um, but, you know, we live in this country where people can't agree on the basic facts of history. And that, that shows you, I mean, it's very interesting. And, and I, I know Joe's really into this. And I think your father was a history professor, wasn't he too? Yeah, and historiography is in, in question with this. What is history? And I'll, um, Oscar Wilde wrote, history is just gossip. And in a sense, that's kind of true that it's what people believe it at a certain time. And it, it makes you question everything, which is very valuable. And one, one rule of thumb I have with the assassination is never take any piece of information at face value, I always double, triple check it, you know, and in my book into the, the nightmare, I left out some things that there was only one source, and I, I couldn't prove it. And maybe I should have mentioned you know, such and such, uh, so and so said such and such, but I was trying to just stick to things that could be proven because there's too much uh, speculation going around. But we have an avalanche of facts on our side, and we shouldn't be defensive about that. No, and I was, I always thought it was funny that, uh, that JFK gets attacked. There are very few Hollywood films, biopics, whatever, that could survive footnotes. Uh, you know, if you imagine El Cid. Or Ben Hur or something, you know. Uh, they died with their boots. The <laughs> they, they, they died with their boots on. Uh, glorifies Custer, for example. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. And uh, and it, you know, so the odd thing is that JFK is actually one of the most historically accurate films ever made, and deliberately so because uh, Zach Scar and and Oliver Stone worked very hard at trying to get things correct. And there's certain things telescoping. There are things you have to do with any when you're making a picture. Uh, but by and large, it's a true story, which you cannot say for 99% of every Bible. Yeah, Jane Rusconi was the researcher. I talked to her at the time. She was a very uh, hardworking, sharp researcher. And they put out a book, you know, the screenplay, but uh, Oliver Stone realized he had made a mistake. He didn't put out the book at the time the film came out. It came out a few months later. It had extensive footnotes. And sometimes he would say, you know, we telescope this scene or this is what we think happened. You know, he was really clear. And when Nixon came out, which I think is a very good underrated film, he made it he made it certain that the, the book would come out simultaneously with the film. And that's very uh, extensively footnoted as well. And so the, the guy is not, you know, making much up, although in a docudrama, you do have to make some uh, things up to dramatize them, but you, you try to base it on fact. And he did that for, for the most part. I think, for example, the Zapruder film was was altered by the CIA. I really uh, believe that. For a long time, I had trouble believing that, but Douglas Horn and other people proved that to me. And uh, Stone accepts the Zapruder film as, as gospel. Um, but that's the state of the thinking in 1992, pretty much. And uh, so I would disagree with that. And the Tippett killing, he does a very interesting thing in that film. He doesn't really say much about the Tippett killing, but he shows it happening in two ways. It's, it goes by very fast and it's kind of subtle. Nobody even mentions it. He shows uh, the Oswald character shooting Tippett and then he shows two other people shooting Tippett, one, one of whom is short and stocky as Aquella Clemens said. 
and, uh, and and he shows the two versions, but he has them both kind of clashing, at, at very fast cutting. And I read that the editor, the film is probably the best edited film of all time. Uh, the editor said he was hitting buttons like this almost arbitrarily to intercut those two things. And it works rather well because it basically says that is the Rashomon uh, point of the film and uh, Stone originally planned it as a Rashomon kind of film and then it, it kind of went away from that concept and but it, it, when he has um, Garrison in the courtroom give his 21 minute version of what happened he said let's let's just speculate for a minute Stone points to that line which most people ignore but I show that 21 minute segment in my classes in, in history and I say here is the best uh, thinking on the subject as of 1992 and uh, uh, it's a very impressive 1991 it came out at, at the end of the year and uh, it's a very impressive uh, kind of what here's what we think happened it holds up rather well so one one interesting thing about the medical evidence that I think it's it's very very baffling when you're seeing like the skull fragment and that you know you go through the whole list of all the medical evidence that they have is it a fact that people just don't believe it or do you think it's just people are scared because i mean if you really look at the jfk assassination and you really think that the government has the ability to do all this of what all the information that has come out since then that is a frightening thing sure so it's easier to, and i know a government tactic it's easier to make instead of admitting that you're crazy to make the other person think that they're crazy but you have a lot of people that are so blindly sticking to the official report of what the government says because i think people like if we say we're clear or we're we're the people that kind of you could say truth you could say whatever you want but it's kind of like us tossing rocks at a dam and that dam eventually going to break everyone else is just kind of walking and accepting what it is like they're in the truman show and then there's people that refuse to be in the Truman Show. So I can get their perspectives of thing. But I mean, if you really talk about a skull fragment, if you talk about replacing a windshield and hiding that evidence, if you talk about trying to make a magic bullet fit, if you talk about making Oswald a patsy, there are a lot of ramifications for each of one of those decisions. But if you're talking about the overall plan, which is making sure that the public has a trust in government or doesn't know that you have these types of powers, that's the plan that we're going with. And I think, uh, 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 Rich, you put up a really good graph that showed the decrease of government trust from the JFK assassination into where we're at now. And it has decreased over time. There's a lot more people that question. I bet there was people around when JFK was shot that'll tell you there's definitely a conspiracy behind it. But the information in the notes that we have now and what goes off of you say something about a skull fragment, someone who's new to the subject like I was. What? That sounds insane because we haven't seen anything like that before. And that is also a fault on the public as well, too, for not questioning more of that, because that is a concern. That is an abuse of power. That is something that is out of, straight out of sci-fi or straight out of a, a horror fiction. And if that's happening today in other forms, in other ways of manipulation, that's a serious issue. And that's where you might get a lot of the answers to a lot of the issues that we have today when it comes to public just disarray or c confusion that graph is a pew trust poll that's been taken been taken um and at least annually since 1958 and it's public trust in government pew trust and 58 to present currently stands at 20 percent trust in government so the tailspin continues but you can see on the graph and if you want to see it, it's at the end of the documentary, The Assassination and Mrs. Payne. It's one of their concluding uh, scenes. It's a 10 second shot animated. And it shows it, you know, rising in 58 up until October 64. They take a poll. And after that, it's a tailspin. And it drops and it shakes around. Uh, and it keep, continues, it, it kind of levels off and then quickly drops again at, at Watergate in 72 to 4. And it eventually recovers during some periods, but it never again recovered above Watergate level. But the, the period of October and the poll that did that was October 64. 
uh, just three weeks after the Warren report. And that's why I call the, the Warren report an act of terrorism. You said, uh, are people uh, in denial or are they afraid? Both. They're in denial because they're afraid and because the Warren report scared everybody to death. The reporting up until that time, the journalism, you were following it, the journalism was pretty good. You can go back and read the papers today, see the most amazing things about the conspiracy, about questioning whether Oswald did alone or not. They, they start talking more and more about when the FBI starts focusing in on Oswald, but it's still, you still hear things uh, in, the, in the press. When the Warren report came out and the press got fully behind the Warren report and said, ah, you see, it was uh, Oswald acted alone. There was no conspiracy. That frightened people because people know, people instinctively know, and they, they have minds of their own. And we, you know, we were hoping even after that, the further investigations would get to the bottom of it. You know, why even have further investigations? They were having the media documentaries, the 67 CBS documentary, you know, they would spend this big, you know, multi-hour CBS reports. NBC did it too. When Garrison came out, they started attacking Garrison. You know, it's pretty obvious, you know, that you wonder why they're going to all this trouble to uh, prop up the Warren report. And people instinctively knew and still know instinctively that it was a conspiracy. And that's the act, you know, that's the lie. It's the big lie, it's the biggest lie. I think the public deserves a lot of credit generally. Uh, I mean, when I was a kid, I remember vividly we trusted the government. It seems kind of we were very naive uh, because, you know, presidents have lied to us since George Washington. But uh, in 1960, when Eisenhower was caught lying about the U-2 plane, that was a big shock. What? Eisenhower lied to us? And of course, he, he did. He had a lot of covert activities before that that he didn't level with the sun, but he was caught in a big, a big lie, and um, that was a shock. Uh, and then the Kennedy assassination. It, I, there was a, a Gallup poll within about a week where uh, uh, I, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but it was something like sixty six, or more than sixty percent thought it was uh, more than one man. They didn't believe the uh, emerging story. The emerging story came together that weekend. Uh, I call it a four day TV docudrama. Oswald was tried, convicted and executed on, on television and in the press. Uh, but there were reports, uh, uh, you know, leaking out into the press, uh, Richard Dudman and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and uh, uh, even the Washington Post and New York Times in December said the bullet that entered Kennedy's back did not go through his body. They, you know, the autopsy doctor put his finger in the wound and it only went in that far, I guess. And, uh, you know, these these stories kept coming out. And as Rich says, by fall of 64, they had all kind of gathered around the Warren Commission. They were going to hold that as their citadel. And um, there were little magazines that had some dissenting stories. And of course, you know, Mark Lane had the most important uh, dissent in December uh, 63, he wrote a long piece in National Guardian, and there was a piece in the New Republic. Uh, but it wasn't until 66 when a bunch of dissenting books started coming out uh, by Epstein and uh, other people and uh, uh, Lane, you know, and other, others that the Sylvia story. Sylvia Marr, Josiah Sil Thompson. Yeah, Sylvia Marr's book, I, I think that's still the best book in the assassination that's a great book that was all 66 that came on that was all 1967 yeah yeah well, yeah right. 66, that period, 67 yeah and even it took main... about three years to read the 26 volumes that's why it took so long yeah yeah i mean it's amazing one of the funny things about the assassination coverage is you know like when when the 26 volumes came out in october 64 belatedly they should have put them out um uh, uh you know at the same time as the report but they, they they contradict the report in so many ways but the the new york times uh ran a story the next day saying there's nothing in the 26 volumes that contradicts the report and they're they're you know who could read 26 volumes overnight i mean even if they got them a week ahead of time 
it's, it's you know many many pages it takes a long time to read as you say and they do that a lot every once in a while when the freedom of information act came out they, they started releasing documents like in 78 79 the fbi released 100,000 documents and hardly anybody looked at them that's where i found stuff uh, about george bush indicating he was with the cia before he admitted it and, but it was just sitting there in plain sight and, and um, but there were stories the next day saying, well, there's nothing much in this stuff. I mean, nobody could have looked through 100 pages, 100,000 pages in one day, but they always claim they do these things, but they don't do the diligent shoe leather journalism that they um, like to uh, celebrate. And uh, so it's left to people like us to go through the material, but there are plenty of us who are uh, on, the, on the job and the public is responding. And I think that the, um, the Gallup report chief said around 2001, he said that consistently the public rejects the, the lone gunman theory by about 70%. And the figure has dropped somewhat in recent years. I'm not totally sure, sure why. But I do find one, I'll just say one, one thing I, I find hopeful is when you talk to young people, I teach at San Francisco State University and I talk about the assassination, they're very interested, they're very receptive and they have an open mind and, and they're not, they don't have that knee jerk thing that a lot of our baby boomer uh, coevals had. You know, when I used to talk to my friends of my age, they would get very uptight when you mentioned uh, uh, you question the Warren theory and they would shut down the discussion and try to imply you're crazy and everything. But the young people don't do that. And uh, I think that's a hopeful sign. Yeah. Well, one of the first, I mean, there were people, like you say, that, that saw it right away. I mean, I think I talked about him last time. I'm always talking about Vincent Slandria, but, uh, you know, the, the Philadelphia lawyer uh, started working on investigating the assassination the Monday following the assassination. So you know, Vincent immediately said, "Okay, what the hell's going on?" And and then when and then when Oswald gets killed, it's like, "Come on, you guys!" And um, you know, so there were people who did see it instantly and started working, realizing that there's something hanky, and it's going to take independent effort. Um, I also think it's really fascinating. There's a uh, to to look at stuff that was published uh, in between the assassination and the Warren report. There's this little book. Uh, that I wrote about a few years ago called The Dangerous Assassins. And it's one of these little, it's just a little popular paperback thing that they put out that showed the stories of different um, assassins. And the very last chapter deals with the Kennedy assassination. And it does it in a very superficial way. But one of the things that I found amusing about it is because the book does not mention the single bullet theory because Arlen Specter hadn't invented it yet. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the, book, the book is published before the single bullet theory oh, had a chance to uh, take effect. So, yeah. Interesting, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating to see the evolution of the story. And, uh, uh, you know, the I, I trace that in my book, Political Truth, uh, the media and the assassination of President Kennedy, that the four, first four days, the story was pretty well formulated and they've stuck to it ever since. But there were leaks or gaps in that story, as you mentioned. And as you say, uh, Spectre formulated the, the single bullet theory in uh, March of 64 and and the media put out their, uh, you know, like um, June of 64, <clears throat> the New York Times ran a prominent story kind of telling the conclusions of the Warren report, which wouldn't come out till September, but they leaked it to him and they, they were still in the midst of supposedly investigating it. That Actually, the, the FBI did the investigating uh, the Warren commission didn't do a lot they held hearings but they were they were not in public people have been mentioning these uh the contrast with the january 6th hearings being on television and very well done for television um like the army mccarthy hearings were very powerful back in 54 but the warren commission hearings were not public except in the case of mark lane who was a lawyer and he said i want this to be public because they would ask each witness do you want this to be open or not, and they would almost everybody would say no, except Lane. But if these hearings had been on television, like the Army McCarthy hearings, we might have had a different uh, uh, response. So the media were kind of controlling. I, I found a statement by Dan Rather in December '64. He was saying, "We're not getting much information now about the assassination." The media uh, was being 
were being shut down pretty fast by the government. And they would tell the media, well, the FBI is working on that. We'll get back to you, you know. And uh, so it was left to little places like there's a, a tiny magazine called The Minority of One that had some good articles. And uh, the Nation had a good article. And, uh, there, you know, Vincent Slander, a, a terrific a researcher wrote some good pieces and Penn Jones Jr. who's kind of a mentor of mine a crusading uh, small town newspaper editor publisher outside of Dallas uh, he, he said um, I didn't believe it was a conspiracy until the Sunday after it happened that's how naive I was he said and a lot of people were kind of galvanized into action when Oswald was shot surrounded by 60 policemen and a lot of media people uh, but around the world, the, 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 you know, the New York Times was very concerned with uh, world reaction. They would run little stories from, you know, various places. Uh, the people outside the U.S. didn't believe the uh, single gunman theory, and they saw through it pretty fast because they have more experience over there of coups and regicide and things of that sort. So the, the, the foreign media were more skeptical, and they didn't have the vested interest of in protecting our in national security state that we do. Well, guess what? The Warren Commission didn't believe it either. They knew it was a conspiracy. Um, within a decade of the report, four of the seven, the majority, had already disclaimed the idea of conspiracy. By 71, uh, John J. McCloy told uh, a congressional committee uh, that uh, he no longer believed that Oswald acted alone. They, the, he no longer believed that they didn't have sufficient evidence of a conspiracy. So that's number five. That leaves two. That leaves uh, Dulles, who died in 69. So uh, we know a lot about Dulles now. But Gerald Ford eventually told Gestard de Stang, the French president, over a private lunch that came out through the French president, who said that, yeah, Gerald Ford told me that they, they knew all along it was a conspiracy. Um, yeah. And Robert, so, Robert Oswald, Lee's brother, was you know inter interrogated by the Warren Commission, and he said that he, Gerald Ford struck him as a very ambitious young man. He found him unpleasant and very aggressive, and that's he, he saw through him right away. You know, he was riding well, that to out, success. You pointed out, Joe, I saw you on another um, podcast where you pointed out that uh, four uh, four current or future presidents were in Dallas the day of the assassination. Right. Four people, uh, Kennedy, Johnson, um, Nixon, and uh, George H.W. Bush were all in Dallas that day, which is pretty amazing coincidence. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, there, there's a, I, I like to use the term coincidence theorists. Those are people. Who, John Judge said, said that. Yeah. He said, if, if you want to call me a conspiracy theorist, I'll call you a coincidence theorist. And, and the CIA has a shibboleth. There's no such thing as a conspiracy. And if you think about spy tradecraft, that has you have to go by that. That has to be one of your mottos. Because if you assume something's a coincidence, you could miss something that's devastating. CIA itself has a shibboleth. There is no such thing as a cons as a coincidence. Yeah, well, that's their business, and they know how things work in the world. And, you know, most, uh, many government crimes are conspiracies of one kind or another. It just means two people conspiring together or, you know, uh, but uh, it, it's very seldom it's just one person takes it upon himself or herself to change history. And Oswald, uh, they could never find a motive for Oswald. The Warren Commission tried, supposedly, and they came up with some cockeyed uh, psychological theory that was very speculative it, it, it wasn't really based on anything because he was known to admire john f kennedy for example i mean how do you factor that in and, he, and also he, he he didn't admit guilt he said i didn't shoot anybody no sir well there's and, arguments that people say it's because he wanted fame but why would you make a why would you be on videotape saying you're a patsy if you want the fame for it you want to publicize it as much as possible but it obviously wasn't seen in that direction that's just some of the voices that i've seen people bring up saying that this is why he did this and it just it doesn't fit the description even the killing of of tippet for instance didn't fit the description they said oswald like what he turned around and shot did a headshot or something it was just like that's an execution that's not really just a 
I'm running because I just shot the president. And now I'm going to, you know, I just shot a cop. I better turn around and make sure I shoot him in the head. No, you're going to shoot and then go away. There's just a lot of stuff where it's like you might have to like blindly trust or make a bunch of lines fit. And this is what I brought up when I talked to someone about the topic of memory. I had a scientist on here speaking about memory. And I said, I brought up the JFK thing because a lot of this does with time, your memory does start to falter. You'll add things in necessarily where they weren't there. When I bring up the evidence aspect of like the things you can find medical evidence or whatever with the assassination of JFK, but people saying, oh, well, there's already been this that's already debunked that. And there's already been this that debunked that. Where? Where, where is the, where is that? Where is that? No, they don't explain. They just move on to the next thing and gloss over it. And it's like somewhere in their memory, it's been enough time that they've created something that fits why that was, oh yeah, that was already came out in an article or that was maybe something I missed or that was something like this. And it's like, see, the, the, there's open questions. There's things that we can get an answer to. And the reason why I'm so keen on like I, I, where I give the public a lot of like I give I give them some slack on the fact of like I get it, it. We didn't know a bunch of things about the government at that point, and then we do know more now. But if we bring it to like Operation Midnight Climax, where they're drugging random people and having them go crazy, all to stir up animosity against the anti hippie movement or the all the hippie protests that were going on. Then you look at just recently Biden admitted to energy weapons and giving compensation to people that were exposed to energy weapons. Where you go. Those okay, so back then everything sounds extreme and crazy, like it's all conspiratorial. They just fucking admitted it in it with energy weapons. I had no clue when I read that. I was like, Am I? I thank God I found the article and I read it on air because anybody hearing it would have been like, Where's your proof? But no, it was because enough people were suffering from side effects that they had to acknowledge it. You're telling me if it was three or four people that were suffering from some type of thing that they would have even said this exists, they wouldn't have. But now that there's been enough people that have been suffering from it and enough animosity has been steered up that they had to give an answer to it. And now they're giving out compensation things. And then that leads down a whole other rabbit hole where I think Joe, uh, Joe green actually got me interested in the dark realms of psychology where I our psychiatry, where I had people on here speak about that, but it brings into this issue of like, how long have they been using energy weapons? And you find out they've been using them quite frequently when it comes to protests and things of this sort. And you start getting into this area of where does the human ethical line be drawn? And who does that fall on to make sure that line in the sand is there? Because, I mean, right now it seems like they're just wiping their foot over it and fucking walking over it. Well, somebody did a, a, a long list of uh, celebrated famous people who don't believe in uh, the lone gunman theory headed by Lyndon Johnson, Robert Kennedy, Jacqueline Kennedy, you could go down the list. J. Edgar Hoover the next morning <clears throat> was on the phone with Johnson. Uh, he said there's not uh, enough evidence to uh, convict this fellow in Dallas. And uh, we also uh, found out that he was apparently being impersonated in Mexico City. You know, I don't think he went to Mexico City and, and Hoover was telling that to Johnson. And Johnson was always privately skeptical. Uh, and so I think there are many, many people out there who uh, say one thing in public, another thing in private. Uh, I, I, my book, Political Truth, I was trying to write that in the 90s and I pitched it to an editor at a major publishing company. And he said, well, I believe in, I believe it was a conspiracy, but we can't uh, print a book like that because we depend on the New York Times for book reviews for all our books. And you can't, we can't publish a book attacking them. You know, and that's kind of, there's a schiz schism, there's a schizoid attitude in our country that uh, people, uh, that leads to this, you know, there is there is something healthy about questioning government, obviously, and not believing what they say, but it's got to the point of, uh, it shows it could be very dangerous as well when you have a presidential election and people, uh, you know, 60 uh, court cases have shown there is no evidence that people still believe it. A lot of people still think it was a stolen election. And, and uh, it's, it's just hardened into a kind of a doctrinaire uh, anti-government attitude, which uh, Reagan kind of started that demonizing the government. And that, now we see that the whole Republican Party is pretty much in that camp, right? It's a, it's a really good point about the, there are striations within the government and different people know different things at different times. But I've always taken one of the strongest uh, pieces of evidence for Oswald not being alone. Uh, 
uh, is the fact that Hoover has been tracking him. And we know he's been tracking him since there's a memo going back to early 1960, where Hoover is talking about that someone is uh, using Oswald's identity. Oswald being a 21 year old kid. Right. Also, think about uh, that. Hoover yeah, knows yeah. this kid exists. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, <clears throat> all the evidence that I've seen points to Oswald being an FBI informant as well as working with the CIA. But he was he was, I believe, in, uh, he infiltrated the plot at Dallas and he was reporting to the FBI. I found <clears throat> evidence of at least three meetings between Oswald and the FBI in Dallas in, in November 63 and maybe more. And uh, some of these, uh, like the day he was killed in the in the Dallas Morning News, the paper that came out that morning, which hits hit the streets before he was shot, said that he had met with uh, the FBI. I believe it was November sixteenth, is what they said. And I was surprised to read that because I, I've never seen that in in any book. And then um, uh, that and and actually um, Henry Wade, the DA of Dallas, told me that Oswald met with the FBI the day before the assassination. Uh, Wade was a former FBI agent. And I said, the day before, I was trying to pin him down. He said, well, a day or two before, you know. And then there was the, the FBI admits that Oswald came into their office around November 12th to deliver, allegedly deliver a note, which they destroyed. And, and right after he was killed, they flushed it down the toilet, literally. And they claimed that the note said, uh, if you don't stop harassing me and my wife, I'm going to do some violent act against the FBI. But we don't know. That's just what they say. So there are at least three uh, meetings, and he was probably reporting to them on what was happening. He was a patriotic American guy working with the uh, intelligence agencies, and he didn't realize he was being set up as the patsy. He was a piece of Wagyu. They bred him for some certain thing. They picked a person with the profile that fit the description, and he paid the price in a sense, which I, I can now understand why people want to believe it was a lone, gut, uh, lone nut thing. Because if you think that your government wanted to get rid of the president or whoever, and they were so willing to let some innocent person pay the price all because he fit the description. I bring up the example, like we say he's 24. It's like if I'm 24, I joined the military when I was 18. By the time I get out, a CEO finds me on a bus corner and goes, hey, kid, you want a job? And I'm like, sure, mister. And then I, next thing I know, I'm the CEO of this giant business. I got nice Cadillacs. I got a nice mansion. I got everything that I could ever want. What could possibly go wrong? And the next thing you know, Someone knocks on my door and it's the police. You're under arrest for embezzlement. It's like, what? And I had no idea that all this was set up. And that's the exact position that he's in. He's realizing that if there are these all small interactions, which I don't necessarily know if I trust everyone talks about there was this interaction at this and this interaction at this. I'll take some of them in account, sure. But I also think that it was a lot of the, his reaction was a lot of the spur of the moment type situation things, too. I mean, if you have a bunch of guys running up to you and grabbing you and bringing you into custody over shooting the president and there's been uh, for, uh, joe from what you've told me there has been not that he couldn't pin him on the first murder of the assassination of jfk but they sure got him on the tippet one where well, i just yeah feel, yeah yeah i had a uh, jim lavelle who was the lead detective in the tippet case and was the guy who was handcuffed to oswald when he was shot the tall uh, uh detective with the white suit and the hat um, interesting fellow, and he gave a lot of interviews. Uh, to, you know, he was willing to talk about it, and he, he he gave me some revealing comments. And one thing he said was, the night of the assassination, Captain Will Fritz, the head of homicide, told him basically, "We don't have a case on Oswald for killing Kennedy. We have to make a case on him for killing Tippett." And so that that's why you know, I found an FBI document. The, it was kind of ignored by people that it said Oswald was never arraigned for the murder of Kennedy, only for the murder of Tippett. He was charged with both crimes, but at the midnight press conference, when um, um, somebody said you were charged with the murder of Kennedy, he was really shocked. And Lavelle said he, t he was telling the truth. We hadn't charged him with it at that point. But I said to Lavelle, why did you think you had a case on Tippett, the Tippett murder? And he said, well, we had witnesses. And that implies, first of all, they didn't have witnesses for the Kennedy murder. They they produced a guy named Howard Brennan who claimed he saw him in the window. But 
there are a lot of problems with Brennan's testimony, including bad eyesight and how could he have gauged the, the height of the man if he was probably kneeling in the window or whatever, uh, if anybody was in that window. But um, when, when he says we have witnesses, one of the vexing problems I, I wrestled with for years, uh, I wrote Into the Nightmare is about two thirds on the Tippett murder, which really hadn't been investigated by the government properly. Uh, and nobody had written a book about it except Dale Myers wrote what I consider the Warren report of the Tippett case. He, he sort of brushes aside all the, uh, the conflicting evidence and puts it in footnotes and dismisses it. But I really went into it as much as I could. And um, um, I found out Edgar Tippett, Edgar Lee Tippett, Tippett's father, gave me an interview. He had never been interviewed by anybody except the FBI briefly. In, 1964, there was a woman named Alfreda Scobie who was working for the Warren Commission, who was a protege of Richard Russell, who was a descending member of the Warren Commission. And she was a very bright uh, lawyer from uh, Georgia. And she wrote a memo that I found <clears throat> at the National Archive to J. Lee Rankin, the head of the commission, you know, the, the working chief. And she said, you know, no, it appears that nobody's really investigating the Tippett murder. I think we should look into this because it seems seems important, you know. So they, they called the FBI and they, they produced in a, in a week a uh, 19-page report on Tippett. <clears throat> and and they, they had biographical information and uh, basic stuff, but they really didn't investigate the shooting. Um, but uh, Edgar Lee Tippett told me that um, soon after the assassination, he, he, he went to Dallas and he, he was with Marie Tippett, the uh, officer's widow. And she told him that another officer had come to her and said that he and JD were sent to track down Oswald shortly after the assassination. And I later found out this was officer William Menzel, who was actually assigned to that district. Tippett was out of his district by several miles. And uh, Mensel and Tippett had been partners at one point, but Mensel said, I got into a car accident on the way and I didn't make it there and, and JD got killed. He, he made it and he got killed. I feel guilty about that. But they were tracking Oswald uh, as early as 1245. And the, the significance of that is that Oswald was not identified supposedly until 210 when he was at the police station. They arrested him at 152 and he had two different sets of identification supposedly on him, but even that is dubious because uh, there's a whole question of, you know, which wallet he had. There were supposed to be five wallets involved. But anyway, um, Oswald was on the loose and they knew somehow that he was going to Oak Cliff and that they, they, they knew who he was. They'd been tracking him. The Dallas police had a kind of a red squad who were um, uh, had, uh, keeping track of Oswald. And, and so they, they knew where he lived in Oak Cliff and they sent these two guys r racing around Oak Cliff and uh, Tippett had um, an encounter with a um, guy. He pulled a guy over on 10th street and uh, looked in the back of his car and didn't see anybody and he took off at high rate of speed and then he went to a record store and he made a phone call and either didn't connect with anybody or he didn't say anything at least and he hung up and he ran out and took off and that's the last people saw of him and he was seen at a gas station looking at the viaduct which if you if you go to Dallas you'll see the viaduct will take you to downtown in five minutes or so uh it's a straight uh, uh route from the uh Texas School Book Depository to uh, Oak Cliff, and he was waiting in a gas station, apparently for Oswald to come on a bus, and the bus went by and there was no Oswald, so he took off at a high rate of speed, so he was he was acting, uh, you know, very suspiciously at that time, so he drove into an ambush, and, and, and what I found to be true is that it was a police ambush, and then the question arises, why why did they ambush him? I and we could talk about that. But the witnesses are very contradictory. There are about 20 people who saw all or part of the scene. And uh, about 10 of them said it was Oswald, and about 10 said there were two men involved or, you know, uh, different, uh, different looking kind of man. Uh, and one, one person said the guy who shot him got into a car and drove off. And Aquila Clemens, who was a great witness, she was half a block away. She was a domestic working in a house there. And she said there were two men, one short and stocky and another guy tall. And, and they were kind of 
across the street from each other and, and one said go on this way and they went in different directions and she was threatened by the dallas police and she they told her not to talk and she eventually gave an interview to mark lane and Mel de antonio for the film rush to judgment in 1966 and she was never seen again she disappeared from the face of the earth and i and other people tried to find her and she was threatened with death but she gave she was very brave gave some interviews and but the people who identified oswald there were problems with almost all their identifications uh, for example um, warren reynolds was a, a guy working in a used car lot a block away and he saw a man running from the scene and he wouldn't identify him as oswald and the fbi he told that to the police and then the fbi came to see him and he wouldn't identify him and then the next day he was shot in the head by an intruder at his uh car lot and he miraculously survived and then he said oh yeah it was oswald you know and then domingo venavides the closest witness he was right across the street he pulled his pickup truck right across the street <clears throat> and he, he kind of saw part of it and he ducked down and he wouldn't identify the the shooter as oswald and so they didn't even take him to a lineup and three years later he told cbs yeah it was oswald but in, in the interim his brother was shot to death in a bar in dallas the brother apparently looked a lot like Benavides, and uh, the the lineups were very the, were very, very tainted. You know, here was a bunch of guys in suits, and then one guy disheveled, bloody, you know, in a t-shirt. It was quite obvious who who uh, they fingered as the assassin. And Mrs. Markham was the main witness, and she kept fainting during the uh, lineup, and they kept reviving her. And uh, her her testimony before the Warren Commission is a farce. They had to keep telling her who she identified, she, you know, it's like very leading questions. So the witness um, uh, picture is very, very weird. Jerry Rose wrote a piece that I thought was very insightful in an assassination newsletter. He, he felt that Jack Ruby had staged the Tippett murder to some extent or helped stage it. And a lot of the people who were there were friends and associates of Jack Ruby, oddly enough. They either had worked for him or they knew him. Mrs. Markham was a waitress who had waited on him frequently at a downtown restaurant, et cetera. And, and um, uh, I interviewed T.F. Boley, who was uh, a man who drove up and he looked at his watch and it said 110. The Warren Commission said the shooting took place at 115. It's very important the time because Oswald was seen outside his rooming house at about one o'clock. And to get to the scene of the Tippett killing, he would have had to walk very fast or nobody saw him walking or running but um i think tippet was killed about 108 or 109 he made a call to the uh dispatcher at 108 and they didn't respond uh so he's probably killed shortly after that but Boley arrived at 110 and um uh, there was a group of people there and mrs markham was there uh, Boley didn't tell me at the time he had worked for Jack Ruby. He had been a bouncer at one of Jack Ruby's nightclubs. He kind of withheld that information. I didn't know that until he got an award from the city of Dallas for report. He called in on the police radio. He, he was a guy who worked for uh, the telephone company. He knew how to operate a radio and uh, they gave him an award for that. And he gave an interesting interview where he talked about how he knew Jack Ruby really well. You know, On the other hand, he gave information that was uh, not helpful to the official story. So uh, they were trying to nail it, 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 the, the backward logic is crazy when you think about it, but it, it worked with the public that if a guy shot a policeman, of course he shot the president, because why else would you shoot a policeman uh, unless you were frantically running from killing the president? It, it does not hold up logically. It wouldn't work in court. And um, Lavelle even told me he thought the killing had nothing to do with the Kennedy assassination. And there are people who claim that, that there was a jealous husband who shot Tippett. I interviewed Tippett's mistress and there was a jealous husband who was tracking them, following them around. Although I, I, I don't believe that story. I, I exonerate this guy based on what I know. Anyway, I don't think we know the whole story it, yet. Yeah. Didn't Tippett say something significant to his child that day also? He had said something yeah, he, he supposedly said, but it's it's um, not totally proven. He, he supposedly told his son, Alan, his oldest son that morning, um, that he loved him. Apparently, he had never really said that much, if, if at all. And he said, just remember whatever happens today, I love you, you know. And it, it sounds ominous in retrospect. He later denied 
having said that, and I couldn't get to Alan Tippett to interview him on that, but um, Tippett had a lot of uh, unusual uh, things going on. He had a mistress and uh, she got pregnant around that time. And she had a daughter who was, uh, some people think was J.D. Tippett's daughter, but she told me Tippett had a vasectomy and uh, couldn't, couldn't father a child at that point. And that was news to me. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's a complicated story. I go into all that in my book. And uh, uh, anyway, yeah, the Tippett murder, I, I think there were two Dallas policemen involved in killing Tippett, uh, e either to lure, you know, what happened was when, when a policeman is shot, everything else is secondary to policemen. And I noticed that in the police radio tape that when Kennedy was shot, they're almost blasé, like, oh, yeah, I think Kennedy was shot in the head, you know. And then when they say an officer is shot, everybody gets frantic, their voices raise and the pace picks up. And I said that to Jim Lavelle, is it true that, you know, you guys got more excited about that than the murder of Kennedy? And he, he said a shocking thing. He said, um, I said, how did you regard the murder of Kennedy? And he said, well, there's an old saying uh, it wasn't nothing more than a South Dallas N-word shooting. And he used the full N-word. Uh, kind of an amazing comment. Um, uh, you know, and a lot of the Dallas policemen were members of the KKK. Tippett's oldest friend on the forest, Morris Brumley, I interviewed him. And I had my tape recorder out in front of me on the table. <clears throat> and we were having lunch and he started telling me how he had quote infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan on behalf of the Dallas police and he's he was bragging and laughing about how they would castrate black men and whip them and stuff and uh, you know he knew my tape recorder was going and I was trying to restrain myself because when you interview somebody you want to keep them talking but I, I finally couldn't resist saying, well, since you're infiltrating them, didn't you ever report some of these crimes? And then he kind of clammed up because, uh, you know, and he showed me his KKK membership card. He took it out of his wallet and showed it to me. It's amazing. And uh, I told that to a researcher in Dallas who knew more about the Dallas police than I did. And he said, he laughed. He said about three quarters of the Klan in Dallas were Dallas policemen. So infiltrating, uh -huh, you know. Um, but anyway, so there, there are many, uh, uh, the Tippett murder is a very interesting and a very critical scene. It was called the Rosetta Stone of the case by David Bellin, who is an apologist for the uh, single bullet theory, but I think it's the Rosetta Stone for other reasons that proves that I don't think Oswald did it. I think somebody else did it. Hey, Joe, um, one of the, one of the, while we're in this area, while we're in South Oak Cliff, one of the most fascinating chapters in your book is called the Carl Mather incident. And I would like to hear you talk about the Carl Mather incident. One of Tippett's good friends, it turned out. Uh, and, but it, it, it really explores the bizarre aspects of that incident, explore the larger bizarre aspects of the conspiracy. It gets outside of the policeman shooting in South Oak Cliff, it goes into some of the most bizarre aspects of the conspiracy there are. Yeah, you wrote this amazing piece about this uh, Rambler you discovered that you, you trace this car and it's all these connections with the assassination, a really amazing piece of research. I commend you for it. And in the Mather case is a little like that because there was a car. Uh, Oswald was seen by a um, guy who was a, a mechanic at a uh, shop very close to Oswald's house. And in Oak Cliff, there's you know, you get off the viaduct and then there's this Mexican restaurant and there's a car shop there and then Oswald's rooming house is right nearby. And then about a mile away is where Tippett was shot. And this fellow who, he had been a Dallas uh, deputy sheriff. So he, he knew th about law enforcement and he saw Oswald sitting in a car, he said, um, <clears throat> after the Kennedy shooting. And uh, he took down the license of the car, which is very smart. He gave it to Wes Wise, who later, be he was a broadcaster. He became mayor of Dallas, eventually, a, you know, a reputable source. And it, the car was traced to this fellow, Carl Mather, who worked for Collins Radio, which was a, uh, a company that had security clearances and they made radios for the US government, uh, including, he, didn't he had personally installed the radios on uh, Air Force Two. The, the backup plane that Johnson often used. And 
uh, Collins Radio got a big contract in Vietnam. One thing is to follow the money, as William Goldman wrote in the screenplay for All the President's Men. Nobody actually said that during Watergate, but follow the money. Collins Radio made out like bandits in the Vietnam War, as did a lot of other Texas companies. That, um, they did a lot of the radio uh, equipment. And, and, and so some people think that Mather might have been involved in some communications among uh, conspirators that day, but we don't really know much about him. Um, he was, he and his wife had lived near Tippett earlier. They had moved away, but they, they were good friends. And soon after this, the Tippett murder, they went to Tippett's house. Uh, and they comforted the widow uh, for a while that afternoon, um, uh, among other people. And uh, Mather was investigated to some extent by the House Select Committee. And he um, he said he would testify only if he got immunity. That's very interesting too. And apparently they didn't really, they didn't grant him immunity and he, he remains kind of a, a question mark. What was that all about? You know, that's a very interesting connection. Why would a guy like Tippett, who was like this sort of humble policeman who had never been promoted in 11 years in the force and was not a terribly intelligent guy and didn't have a great record. Why, why would he hang out with a guy who had that important job for the government. Uh, I think Tippett probably had some government connections. You know, it's hard to prove. I tried to get his military file from the government and they wouldn't give it to me. Um, Tippett would, yeah, anyway, it's a long story, but that's that's the Carl Mather story. It's one of the well, questions. And, and the main aspect is that he, he took down the license number of the car because he, he had later realized that the guy driving the car and parked there awkwardly after driving high speed and parking there, was identical to Lee Harvey Oswald. And this is happening at the same time a supposedly second Oswald was being arrested or just after being arrested in the alley behind the Texas. Yeah, uh, right. mm -hmm. yeah well, you know, I have a thing in my book, um, Political Truth, about what if we had known on November 22nd a bunch of things, for example, the Zapruder film was altered, the body was altered, Kennedy's body was altered. But what if we had known there were two Oswalds It would have blown our minds? We weren't, we weren't really able to deal with things like that at the time. But it turns out, I mean, I was an agnostic on some of these issues for a long time until people proved it. Uh, John Armstrong's amazing research proved to me there were two Oswalds. And Greg Lowry, who's a good researcher on the Kennedy uh, the Tippett case, said that's the thing that vexes him the most about how to sort out the Tippett uh, evidence. He, he really works hard on it, but he says, I can't wrap my mind around the fact that there were two Oswalds running around. They apparently were both in the theater for a while. There was a, a person arrested in the balcony. Uh, the police report said that uh, Oswald was arrested in the balcony. And then uh, the person we know as Oswald was hauled out of the, the main floor and had a scuffle with the police and they dragged him outside and he was photographed. And, but the guy who was in the balcony apparently was led out into the alley, as you say, and the, there, there's a, a man who ran a store nearby who witnessed this and he, he thought he had witnessed the, the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald and he wondered why this guy was released. Apparently he was taken away in a police car and, and never seen again. So the, there were two Oswalds rendezvousing. I, 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 frankly, I don't quite understand what was involved there. A lot of people think Oswald, the historical Oswald, I guess, is what you would call the man who was arrested and brought to the police station was probably there to meet some contact. Uh, intelligence operatives often meet in theaters, you know, it's a secluded place to me and he was, he was kind of looking around for his contact also the, the whole the, idea of the, the spy seat. I, I gotta i gotta i gotta ask a question you're giving me so much i got i got questions one is a more directed question to joe green but at the same time i would like to hear all three if uh you guys could answer it um if we i i, I heard doug horn say this and he talked about giving amnesty to the people or just getting the information out now or knowing the truth now that if there were people that were still alive, even back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, would they give them amnesty or would they pardon them for whatever they did, whatever their involvement would be just for the correct information for the history books and to set the record straight in a sense. I mean, I like Joe Green's aspect of like the philosophy at like kind of angle with it. Um, and I want to know. Is that a right thing to do? Is that a is that a good thing just to get the correct information? Because you're basing it off of, and I know you're shaking your head, but I, 
when you get to this aspect of correcting the history books for future generations as well too but at the same time does that not open the door for them to do it again yes okay yeah no i don't think that would accomplish anything um first of all if you were really involved would that make you say okay i'm let me admit the fact that i was involved in the kennedy assassination Probably. i don't think it would i don't think that that would make a difference if the government says we're not going to prosecute you at this day if you admit that you're and what is the government's motive to do this because they're the prime suspects right anybody who's doing the assassination is doing so at the behest of elements within our own government so i don't see a scenario where that would actually play out and i don't think it would be any good and if they did do that i think that would open the door to having fake witnesses essentially come forward and say all kinds of nonsense. Um, I don't think it would clear anything up. I think it would just add to the mud. So yeah, there's a, a problem in the case that we have these uh, fraudulent people coming forward like uh, Judith Baker and uh, Beverly Oliver who are easily exposable fraud. Uh, like the Zodiac <laughs> killer. It's the Zodiac yeah, killer. Fra frauds. Yeah. But, you know, Ruth Payne, maybe we could focus on Ruth Payne a bit because she is still alive and she's an obvious collaborator in the assassination to some extent. And the, the, you can debate how witting or unwitting she was, but she's alive and well in Santa Rosa, California. And Max Good just did this excellent film, The Assassination of Mrs. Payne. Uh, he got her to talk. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 I advised Max for a while early in his process. We talked about how best to approach her, you know, how, how do you get her to talk and not walk away and refuse to talk but he, he did a wonderful job of getting her to sit and be questioned and he he put in <clears throat> people who uh debunk her and then he put in people who defend her and it's a very well-made film very uh, independent film uh made with his own uh, resources uh low budget but it looks re really good and i recommend it it's on a number of streaming sites and uh ruth payne would be the kind of person that you if there were a truth and reconciliation commission which worked in south africa joe's probably right it probably wouldn't work here i mean for one thing very few people are around anymore uh, witnesses of mostly died off. Um, the people I interviewed, uh, Henry Wade and Jim Lavelle and Ed Gurley Tippett, and uh, those people are gone. Uh, so there aren't a lot, but there are a few uh, uh, suspects or persons of interest who you could get to talk. But I don't, I don't know if that would get Ruth Payne to talk, probably not. But well, she, ta she talks as much as she is willing to. And, and uh, what Max does, he confronts her with documents, which I, I thought was a very good strategy that <clears throat> she sits there and um, he says, well, here's a document showing your sister was in the CIA. What do you think of that? And she was trying to fudge it for a long time saying, I don't know what my sister did, but she visited her that summer. And um, she said, yeah, well, maybe she worked in the CIA and, you know, things like that. He, he gets her to kind of uh, admit certain things, but I, I found it interesting too, because the camera is often very tight on her and, and John Ford was asked how you look at a movie. He said, look at the eyes. The secret is in the eyes, the, the, the eyes expressions. That's the key to the personality. And so Max often holds on Ruth Payne kind of looking around uh, uh, furtively when she's answering a question. I told him, please keep it in there and let the camera linger on her. And, you know, let's, let's see her reactions. Um, <clears throat> and he has a great sequence of her saying the same thing in almost the same words over a period of like 40, 50 years, you know, montage of things to show how trained an operative she is and how well rehearsed. And you, as I just saw a podcast with Max who said, uh, well, you could take it two ways. One is that she's following a script very well or that she's telling the truth. You know, if you want to look at it that way, he's, he's leaving it up to the audience. And he was asked, what, what is your view now after doing this film? Do you think she was a conspirator or not? And he said, I'd rather leave that up to the audience uh, rather than me telling you. And I respect that. I think that's a smart move. And I told him that John Ford would do the same thing. He would never give a straight answer to a question about his films because he wanted us to look at the films and make up our, our own minds. <clears throat> and Stanley Kubrick told Spielberg that too. He said, never tell the press what your intention was in making a film because that's all they will say about your film, you know? And the only time Spielberg broke that rule was on Munich, which I think he felt was such an important you know, hot button political issue. He had to 
say exactly what he was intending and they still beat him up for uh you know they twisted around what he said in that film but i i think max is, is smart because he's he's giving you all the information the best possible interview that one can get with this very uh highly intelligent well-trained operative and uh, let you make up your own mind so have you, were have the, you seen the film well were the pains were they just uh, like keeping tabs on oswald and setting him up for this scenario so that was the whole that, that was their whole role in it or because i've heard people say that she was also being manipulated by the cia and i just haven't watched that documentary and i haven't dived into the pain subject yet you should you should see it um i mean i, I mean probably every researcher has their own idea about what was going on with the pains um and i, I know that if if you were like starting a new investigation today ruth Payne is probably the first person i want to talk um, that, that you would want to talk to on the stand. Um, but it, you, you should really check it out and, and try to make up your own mind. Because what it, Max does a really great job of showing exactly who she is by just letting her talk. She was the babysitter for Marina Oswald. And James Hosty, the Asian, FBI agent who was assigned to the Oswalds, wrote in his book that he, he thought Marina Oswald was the main subject of interest because they thought she was a KGB agent and she probably was connected with uh, Soviet intelligence and then turned in America and uh, turned against Oswald on behalf of the CIA. Um, but um, uh, Mrs. Payne took in Marina and took, uh, all of Oswald's belongings were in her garage for a while, almost all of them. And she had this magic garage that kept producing evidence you know, I, I, I went to a, uh, an event she did in Santa Rosa for the women's club, and we weren't allowed to ask her questions directly. We had to put questions in a little basket, and they pulled them out. And I had two questions. They only pulled out one, but I, Jim Diogenio and I crafted this one. It was, um, how is it that um, after the Dallas police and the sheriff's department thoroughly searched your home that weekend, uh, items kept coming out of your home implicating Oswald in the assassination and her eyebrows raised like that I could tell that she she understood exactly the import of that question and, and she basically uh, kind of dodged and said well they missed things they weren't very professional etc you know but there was this famous note that Oswald wrote to Marina supposedly uh, with instructions what to do after he shot General Walker which he didn't do either, but that was part of the frame up is he took a shot at this right wing general. Uh, this is supposed to show his propensity for violence, but why would you shoot a right wing general and a, a liberal president of the United States? It doesn't add up. But uh, Mrs. Payne, that she's really, she told the audience there, she said, my litmus test, she didn't use the word litmus test, but she said, when somebody calls me, she's in the phone book. Uh, I asked him, do you know about the Walker note and what do you think about it? And if they don't know about it, she won't talk to them. And if if you give the wrong answer, like, you know, you wrote it yourself, the Secret Service returned the note to her and they thought she'd written it, you know, for example. Uh, it's a tricky situation and Max somehow navigated this uh, difficult, these shoals and got in with her and, and was uh, empathetic. You know, like Errol Morris, my friend who's a great documentarian, he said his his role as a documentarian is to listen to people and say as little as possible. And you don't lead people, you know, you just listen. And he said, if you listen to anybody talk for 30 minutes uninterrupted, they will show you how crazy they are. That's his, his uh, credo, credo. So Ruth Payne just expounds and it's, it's interesting, you know, to see her in her retirement habitat and uh, kind of get a sense of her. But it, she's a very, she's a tough nut to crack, isn't she, Joe? Well, well. Were there a lot of people that interviewed Marina Oswald? There were some. They have an interview in the film. Uh, Tom Brokaw interviewed her, and they didn't. Uh, Max didn't include the moment where she walks up the set because he was just hammering her with, uh, you know, Oswald did it, and you know, Marina's changed her story so much over the years that she's kind of not a very uh, she's sort of a worthless witness at this point because you don't know what to believe. Yeah, yeah. She was she was held prisoner by the Secret Service for a long time, and she, you know, she was threatened with deportation, and and uh, she 
said what they wanted her to say and then she changed her mind later and you know but we don't know and, and max tried to interview her and she, he said she was very nice to him but she said i really don't want to talk anymore you know and but she was she talked a lot on the record to the warren commission uh but she implicated lee the two people who gave all the oswald called it the so-called evidence he told his brother don't believe all this so-called evidence the stuff was produced by Ruth Payne and Marina. They, they had this bounteous garage where they kept pouring out evidence and saying, yeah, he had a gun. And John Armstrong proves that Oswald didn't own a pistol or a rifle, for example. You know? So wait, Marina, <coughs> Marina was purposely putting out evidence of Oswald? Well, yeah, in she, custody. She was being manipulated. Um, in the film, I think Max does include this, that... Uh, Marina and Ruth Payne went their separate ways after the assassination for an interesting reason. And you talk about that in your book, too, that uh, she was told by the Secret Service that Ruth Payne was uh, very sympathetic and connected to the CIA. And that's the Secret Service telling her that. And so she distanced herself from Ruth Payne after that. Yeah. Yeah. Ruth was very upset about that. And, you know, before Ruth Payne, there was George de Morenschild, who was this uh, very right. uh, uh, mysterious, enigmatic uh, right wing character who was a cartoonist, uh, a cartoonist friend of mine posted on Facebook for, for funny responses. He posted, I'm going to the 70s. Can I bring you anything? And everybody answered with their favorite toys or records or clothing or dance moves and my answer was George de mm. It'd be great to talk to him. He did write a book called I Am a Patsy, which you could read. It was not published, but it's floating around the internet. But he allegedly uh, killed himself, but so, some people think he, he was murdered. It was the day that Gaten Fonzie, the House Select Committee investigator, was uh, telling him they wanted to talk to him. And he was also taking a lunch break from an interview with Edward J. Epstein, who's a CIA connected uh, researcher, and he happens to die in the middle of the interview. Uh, He's one uh, of the mysterious deaths. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, so he, that's the he, thing I don't understand. There are so many mysterious deaths where it's like you can understand one or two and then people say it's a coincidence on all of them. But like some of them, I'm like, I can hear a phone call where they it seem like they're going to talk and it seems like it's kind of a little bit scripted in a sense where I'm like, all right, is this one accurate? But there's a lot of eyewitness encounters or eyewitness people that were killed. Now, when it gets very, very strange for me, which is like I said, I haven't seen this from the government before, but I also don't put it past them, which is like you get to the Jack Ruby scenario. Jack Ruby gets cancer right before his court date, like drastically. And now I know we don't I just actually talked to someone earlier about cancer biology and the cancer growth and how quick a cell goes. And he talks about rapid rates and everything of that sort. But I mentioned the Jack Ruby thing. I was like, that's suspicious. And he's like, it's definitely like a rare, rare anomaly. And I'm like, that's what I, that's like. That's saying it's creepy and scary without saying it's creepy and scary. Well, he's he thought that he had been uh, given cancer. Yeah, it's not it's not outside the realm of possibility. A lot of these things that seem bizarre, you you do research and you find out that they were experimenting with all kinds of ways of infecting people and uh, you know biological weapons, and they they could have induced cancer, or heart attacks. A heart attack is a common method of killing somebody without making it look like a murder. You can induce a heart attack. So why wouldn't they have killed Kennedy at his house then? Why did they have to do it in a public display to show off their power in some secret way or something? Yes, yeah, yeah. Vince Salandria said that. He said it was uh, to, sh to show their power, to say that we are now in control of the government and nobody, nobody elected Congress, the president, nobody has control. We are in control. That was the message they sent. I also think he was as intimidating as like the one conclusion I can draw to Trump. And I'm not a Trump bird at all. I don't, I don't know. I don't care for him. But it's the money aspect. It's very, very strange when you can't control someone when they literally can fund themselves. And Kennedy was like that as well, too. He had power. He was the richest president in history. 
Kennedy was the richest president in history so until he, Donald Trump. He didn't until need Trump. government backing on that. And I think that's a threat to the establishment in a sense. If you can have one person that doesn't need you, um, your approval on things, the past thing, if he could just make decisions on things too. And it was actually something you mentioned when you were talking about um, the guy you were, uh, interviewed who was showing you your his KKK card and everything. Where I start going, could you chalk up a small portion of maybe some of the things and maybe the times back then? as well too when it comes to the area of getting him out when it comes to the idea that he was very advanced thinking and the methods of strategies when it comes to equal opportunity i mean i bring up uh what is it uh oh god uh damn i'm gonna forget his name the guy from africa who wrote a letter to all these college institutions and kennedy funded him a hundred thousand dollars tomaboya 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 yeah so Kennedy, uh, also, I found out there's a book called Mr. Kennedy and the Negroes who came out in the 60s and it turned out that Obama's father was brought yep. to the United States with K Kennedy funding. They, they supported a program to bring uh, highly educated uh, African uh, intellectuals over to America and Obama's father was one of them. So that's an Oliver's that's an Oliver's film as well too. Robert Kennedy goes in depth about that. Um, cause he met Obama and Obama told that to him. That's what I thought I was like, cause if you have to think about the times back then as well too, I mean, you could say like, yeah, maybe that's a small, very, very small percentage of people that didn't want to question the president or uh, not question the president question the official Warren commission. Cause they just wanted that president out because maybe of his advanced thinking. But also if you think about the politics, politics of texas if you think about how the texas law enforcement was i mean if you have a bunch of people that are kind of known to be maybe discriminatory towards other races i mean if there's a plot like that and there's not really going to be a lot of coverage on trying to figure out the answer it's just easier to go with whatever they're saying well the mayor that's basically of what the thesis of oh i was go ahead yeah rich um, wrote a whole book on that yeah right the mayor of Dallas at the time was Earl Cabell. Um, he was the brother of Charles Cabell, one of the three men that Kennedy fired over the Bay of Pigs, Richard Bissell, Charles Cabell, and Alan Dulles. And we now know, because of file releases, that Earl Cabell was a contract agent for the CIA, which doesn't surprise us. We knew that the brother connection was probably... And also, the Cavils are a major uh, force in, in Dallas history, going back, way back. Uh, Earl Cavill was not the first Cavill to be mayor of Dallas. Uh, and they had KKK connections back in the 20s when the, the KKK did run Dallas back in the, in the 20s. And uh, that's where the Cavils came out of, that kind of power. And uh, I had a contact in Dallas um, who um, knew Earl Cavill and I asked him he I said tell me tell me about Earl Cavill he said oh Earl didn't want to be mayor uh, he, he had better things to do uh, and he knew what it was to be mayor because it was in his family and it was just a big hassle to him and uh, but he he he, he was arm twisted into it in the 62 election. I am fast. I haven't written about it yet, but one of, one of the things, one of the projects, if we can get our think tank up and running, one project I want to do is a deep, deep study of the 1962 election where people are put in power in that election that are going to play major roles in a powerful way in 63. And Earl Cabell being one of them, and he didn't want to be mayor. He was arm twisted. Too. Uh, wasn't the uh, the mayor was not as powerful in Dallas as a mayor is in some other cities, right? Isn't that true? That there was a citizen well, council, and, citizens council that controlled the city more, huh? Right. That's kind of, yeah, we had a lot of uh, city manager type. We had that in San Antonio. I think Austin's the same thing. Our lieutenant governor is powerful than our governor. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, our, our, we have a weak governor. To in our, in our yeah, some people, you know, I mean, it's a sensitive issue for Dallas. I mean, I went to the 2013 uh, anniversary, 50th anniversary, where 
Dealey Plaza was blocked off by the police. And I was standing right there, you know, uh, looking at these police officers. They looked kind of embarrassed and, and chagrined to be in this position. But you had to get special passes to get in. I didn't even bother applying because, you know, what's the point? But uh, they, were, they were speaking on, the, on the, you know, the grassy knoll. And they had David McCullough giving the main speech. And he's a member of Skull and Bones. And he's a lying historian who's one of our richest and most prominent historians who's been caught fabricating uh, things about important presidents. And he gave a, a speech. And it had nothing to do with the assassination. It was a very anodyne speech about Kennedy and what a great man he was and everything. And the mayor spoke. The whole event was to try to whitewash Dallas's involvement as the Sixth Floor Museum does. It's a complete lone nut uh, propaganda operation. But, you know, when you get into it, Dallas uh, police were heavily involved in the assassination and, uh, and uh, Henry Wade, uh, you know, was closely uh, involved in, in things. He gave me a very candid interview, an interesting guy, but a very, very slippery fellow. But there were plots against Kennedy that, that month in uh, Chicago and Tampa and Miami. He was almost, uh, he was set up to be killed November 2nd in Chicago. And there's a great piece by Edwin Black, a good journalist who uh, investigated that. And Abraham Bolden, who was recently pardoned by President Biden, was a Black Secret Service agent in the White House who tried to blow the whistle on this. He was in the Chicago office at the time. He had found so much racism in, around the president's uh, protection that he, 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 got a, he said, I want to leave and go to Chicago. And he was aware that they were tracking this assassination squad of four people, including some Cubans. And they captured a guy who they uh, would have used as the patsy. He was somewhat similar to Oswald in his, his history. And he worked in a warehouse on this uh, parade route, which would have taken Kennedy through this uh, these big buildings and, and onto a freeway ramp to go to the Army Navy football game. And Kennedy, Kennedy's trip was canceled at the very last minute. The press plane had already left uh, Washington for Chicago and Kennedy didn't go and uh, uh, he would he might have been killed. But the president of Vietnam, uh, Ziem, was killed the, the, basically the same day or the day before. It depends on you know, how you look at the international timelines. So that would have made it really obvious, the Vietnam connection of the presidents of Vietnam and uh, South Vietnam and the United States have both been killed at the same time time some um, people have speculated that it was going to be a triple the plan was for a triple assassination of dm kennedy and castro all within like a week as a as a very strong message to the world yeah there was you know peter dale scott uh, in his book uh, deep politics and the death of john f kennedy he, he goes into what he thinks was the ulterior motive partly was to spark an, uh, uh, an invasion of cuba again because kennedy had promised castro and khrushchev he wouldn't invade cuba after the bay of pigs and, and the cuban missile crisis but the, the joint chiefs of staff were itching to invade cuba and uh, that's why in this theory that the, they fell back on the lone nut theory as a way of stopping uh, what would have been a ruinous invasion of Cuba who might have provoked a nuclear war. Uh, but Johnson, Johnson's involvement was pretty obvious too. I mean, for a long time, there's a theory in psych psychology called the point of maximum resistance. We all have a point of maximum resistance. The thing we, we least want to talk about, you know, whether it's in our private lives or in the public life. And I, for the media, the point of maximum resistance is either 9-11 or JFK. They don't. They can't tell the truth about those things. But uh, for me, it was Johnson being involved. I got very upset when people would say back in the '60s Johnson was involved. And I wrote a couple letters. I'm embarrassed by now to our college newspapers saying the play, Mc, what was it called, McBird was outrageous, libelous, you know. But um, the more and more you study the case, it's really inescapable that Johnson was heavily involved. I mean, you can't deny, nobody could really deny if you just point out that he controlled the autopsy, he controlled the Warren Commission, he controlled the cover-up because he was commander in chief and it was a military autopsy, it was a false autopsy. And Doug Horn found witnesses to the pre-autopsy autopsy where they smashed Kennedy's head and took out evidence of bullets. I, I found an FBI document that destroys the Warren report uh, written by A.H. Belmont, who was the FBI 
official in charge of the investigation. The night of November 22nd, he said, um, there's a bullet lodged behind the president's right ear, and we're in the process of obtaining that. And that bullet never made its way into evidence. But there were a number of witnesses, including Secret Service agents and civilians, who said that Kennedy was shot in the uh, right temple. And that's the wound that blew out the back of his head. And the brains flew out the back. All the doctors and nurses at Parkland said there was one big hole in the back of his head. There wasn't this giant hole that you see in the war in the as a Pruder film, which was uh, animated that weekend by the CIA in Rochester, they altered the film and added that uh, big uh, hole. And that hole was made by the doctors in a hurried uh, pre-autopsy autopsy. And Horn actually found witnesses to that. Could, could I disagree with you on the Lyndon Johnson thing? Only because I don't think the factor that he was involved into the plot, I think that he found out what happened and what he had to change his opinion and fear of because in my opinion when you hear the phone call where he's with J. Edgar Hoover and he talks about how many bullets were there and it's like three shots he goes were any of them fired at me right there I'm carrying that into the aspect this guy likes to cover his own ass or cover his own skin and I think when you find out that the government did kill JFK and now you're in charge of this government play fucking ball and I think that's what I get. And also, if you read Lady Bird's testimony when they were riding behind um, the, the Kennedy motor or they were in the Kennedy motorcade and they were riding behind Kennedy, it, it a lot of it doesn't seem like like anything you would be able to circle a, a thing around and be like this is this is a funky thing out of line or there's like if you watch ruth Payne's any i've seen her older stuff when she's giving like this thing it does sound like it's scripted a little bit in a sense and when you're reading something like a, a testimony from lady bird i just look at it like uh, i don't i don't see anything that seems scripted and i think it's like a they didn't know but then uh, Lyndon Johnson found out. And then at this point, he's like, I need to cover my own ass to make sure I can save my own skin. And he doesn't go into it. Well, I, I would say, first of all, she didn't give actual testimony. Neither did her husband. They both gave statements to the Warren Commission. They weren't really examined. Um, she may not have been witting uh, to what was going on. She knew she was heavily involved in his corrupt business activities, but she probably wasn't uh, signed on to the plot. Now, I'll, I'll tell you what I've learned from Senator Ralph Yarborough, who was the Democratic senator riding in the car with Johnson and Lady Bird, two cars behind Kennedy. Um, Penn Jones always said in the famous James Alkins AP photograph panoramic shot of the assassination, you don't see Johnson in the car. He's like this, you know, you can see the, sort of the top of his head in shadow. And Penn always said Johnson was the only one in the motorcade who ducked which is very suspicious. And so I asked Yarborough, what was Johnson? I don't think anybody ever asked him this question. What was Johnson doing during the motorcade before that? And he said he was just sitting there. He was very quiet, didn't wave his hands, didn't recognize the crowd or anything. And uh, he said it was very un untypical, atypical of Johnson, who was, you know, great politician. And uh, Yarborough said he turned to him and said, you know, these people love you, you know, uh, acknowledge them, wave your hands. And Johnson was very preoccupied and very tense and very somber. And I said, what do you attribute that to? And he said, uh, I think it was he was worried about Don Reynolds testifying before the Senate committee at that time. Don Reynolds was a, a guy who was uh, made to give a bribe to Johnson, and uh, he was providing all the evidence to the Senate committee. But uh, Yarborough said, that's my retrospective uh, assumption, because I didn't know about that at that moment. But um, that weekend also, uh, Robert Caro's uh, latest volume on Johnson lies about a couple things about Johnson, but it does go into detail about Don Reynolds' testimony, which is very important. It, it would have implicated Johnson in crimes. And Life Magazine had a task force of eight or 10 reporters working on Johnson's finances. They had been running articles in the Bobby Baker scandal for uh, th uh, like three or four weeks before that. They were planning a big article for November 29th issue on Johnson's finances. And they were having a meeting in New York at the very moment. And, and Carol goes into this in detail. And uh, uh, Education Forum has, has uh, turned up a guy from Life magazine who was privy to some of this. And they, they, they interrupted their uh, investigation because he became president. 
and it blew over, but they ran an article the following year about his corrupt finances, but uh, the Republicans in Congress tried to keep that going and went on for a few months and then it kind of was, nobody wanted to face the facts. But anyway, so I said to um, uh, Yarborough, Johnson claimed that Rufus Youngblood, the Secret Service agent in the front seat, jumped over the seat to protect Johnson with his body. And he made, he gave Yarborough, uh, Youngblood, a medal and made him deputy chief of the Secret Service in, in return. And Yarborough scoffed at that. He said, that didn't happen. He, he stayed in the front seat. He was a big man. And he said, this back seat was full, me, Lady Bird, and LBJ. Johnson was a big man. And he said, if another big man had been jumping over the seat, I would have noticed it. And he said, uh, so I said, well, what happened there? Was he ducking or what? And he said, what was happening was there was a gap between the two front seats. There was the driver and there was, the Secret Service man, and uh, Johnson was leaning over the gap, listening to the walkie-talkie that Youngblood had over his shoulder. It was a large walkie-talkie. You could see it in some photographs. And there were two radio frequencies. In the uh, one was just within the motorcade, and the other was connecting it to uh, the Pentagon and the White House Situation Room and other important places. And <clears throat> they were listening to one of these uh, channels. And they both had their heads kind of huddled over. That's why you don't see him uh, sitting up straight. And you could interpret that as ducking if you want to, but it's also listening for information. And, and Youngblood testified to the Warren Commission that he was listening to the internal channel. And then he, when the shooting took place, he switched to the other channel that connected with the White House. I suspect he, it was the other way around. They had the external channel on. And then, uh, but anyway, uh, then Yarborough said when the car took off, uh, as is going toward this triple underpass, he was asking them, what happened? What happened? And they wouldn't talk to him. But Yarborough said the car stopped, the Kennedy car stopped or came to a near stop. There were 51 people who said that, which is very suspicious. And you don't see that in the Warren, uh, in the Zapruder film, you see the car kind of slowing. But he said the car stopped and, and uh, Secret Service men were pouring out of the car behind Kennedy. He thought a bomb had gone off in the car. He didn't quite understand, although he was a hunter and he understood there were gunshots. But um, in the Zapruder film, you just see one agent, Clint Hill, jumping off the car and, and running toward the car. And it's known that another agent started off the car and he was called back by the, the lead agent. But Yarborough said there, they swarmed around the car and you don't see that in the Zapruder film. So that's, that's another uh, kind of inside... Uh, uh, thing about Johnson. Uh, th there's a lot of circumstantial evidence about Johnson's connections, uh, but, you know, and he had uh, allies. Connolly was his, you know, right hand guy, et cetera. And Connolly was heavily involved in, in persuading Kennedy to come to Texas, you know. And uh, uh, you hey, can, you Joe. Can, yeah. Were, did you go to any of the Dallas conferences in 91, 92? Well, I don't think I was there that early, uh, Rich. I think I was there later. Uh, uh, I went to some conferences. Which ones were you thinking of? Uh, the ASK conference, the Assassination Symposium on Kennedy. No, I wasn't was at those. I was at John Judge had conferences. Yeah. Right. That was later uh, after the ASK conference uh, turned everything over to Mary Farrell. You do some excellent writing on Mary Farrell in your book as well. Yeah, I, I really figured that she was an agent who was sent to, she was tasked with keeping tabs on all the researchers and finding out what they were doing. I, I suspected her from the get go. And Penn Jones said, stay away from Mary Farrell. She's, you know, an agent. But what do you, uh, you know, the, the, when you mentioned Johnson's involvement, this is kind of a third rail for a lot of Kennedy researchers. Um, nobody's done a good book on it yet. There have been people who've written. That's where I was going with this. Yeah. Uh, at, at the 92 conference, George Michael Evica, who wrote And We Are All Mortal, one of the great books on the assassination, he uh, gave a, an amazing presentation. He had done some in-depth research on the trip planning, and he, I think he nailed it. Um, now, he never wrote about that. Uh, I was hoping it, it would end up in his last book. Um, but uh, no, he never he never developed that and published it. But he gave that presentation and a tape recording was made. It was a workshop done as a workshop. And I was there at the workshop. Um, I was so impressed by it. I bought the tape of it from the conference 
afterward, and I made a transcript of it, and I have it in digital form. I can send it to you. The most amazing detail. Guess who was in charge of the trip planning and twisting arms to make sure you get your target in the triangulation of fire into the kill zone? John Conley was in charge of it. Yeah. I also all, found, uh, to my surprise, Kenny O'Donnell, was, I think, was an inside man on the assassination. Nobody had ever said that before, but his, he uh, kept coming up in my research. And I wanted he, to direct you yeah. to George Michael Evica's writing because he differs with you at the end in the conclusion. Uh, I know that you, you became very focused on O'Donnell. Evica has a different conclusion about O'Donnell, and that's why I wanted you. I'll send it to you. Yeah, I studied the, uh, the the motorcade was finalized on November 14th in the office of Eugene Locke, who was the head of the Democratic Party in Texas and a very important figure. And he later became Mrs. Tippett's lawyer, oddly enough, and strange connections all over the place. But they had this meeting uh, with um, um, the Secret Service agent Lawson, who was uh, the head agent for the planning of the trip. And Jack Pewterbaugh, who was representing the White House, Pewterbaugh was really just an agent for Kenny O'Donnell. And O'Donnell was the guy who basically uh, said, we're going to take Kennedy's body out of Texas illegally. And he, he spearheaded that, for example. But he was the guy who was relaying a lot of information. He said Connolly was pressuring them a lot. Uh, to have a certain motorcade route. I mean, that was the, the crucial thing is the planning of the motorcade route because if if the car had not taken that sharp turn on Elm Street, that was against all the Secret Service regulations. A sharp turn like that slowed the car to 11 miles an hour, which is uh, the, the cars were supposed to never go below 25 miles an hour. And uh, if the car had gone down Main Street, straight route, they could have built a wooden ramp. There was a kind of a median there. Their excuse was, well, there was a concrete median, but they could have easily built a wooden ramp to take them onto the freeway and avoided that route. But there was also a question of, do we do the luncheon at the uh, Women's Center or, or the Market Hall? And the Women's Center would have been a different route, and but it would have taken them through uh, some unpleasant parts of Dallas, I guess. And uh, they, they were very proud of the trademark. It was a, kind of a new thing they were showing right. off. But at the moment, at the moment, they chose the trademark over the women's building, and the Secret Service was in favor of the women's building at, at Bear Park because it was safer. But at the and but this is part of Connolly's arm twisting, and Evica brilliantly develops this. Uh, the moment they chose the trademark was the moment it mandated that route through Dealey Plaza. Right. And the trademark had a lot of security problems. It had balconies and, and uh, walkways and stuff, kind of like in the movie, The Parallax View, where they had they were shot, shot this candidate from a, a walkway and Secret Service didn't like that. Um, but there was some uh, talk that the, the Kennedy might have been killed at the trademark. Some people were worried about that, that that's uh, maybe a secondary place where they, if they failed in the uh, Dealey Plaza, they might have gotten him at the trademark. Yeah. My, my talk with Vince, Vince told me that the weirdest or the thing that is easy, the first thing you can point blame to is the fact that the Secret Service should have checked those tops of those buildings. They should have they should have looked around, especially at the um the school book uh, depository building or anything in that general area should have been checked. But there wasn't any of that. Like there was a there's a weird scenario where they completely directed differently from what they've done in the past and what was known to be regulations and things of that sort. Of crowd is too, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Vincent Palomar has written wonderful uh, books. He's the expert on the Secret Service and he's interviewed everybody you can get to. There, I read a book in 1962 called Secret Service Chief by U.E. Bauman, who was replaced by Kennedy as Secret Service Chief. And, and he wrote a lot about the dangers in, of motorcades and he spelled it out. And so I was aware of that at the time. And he said, um, Secret Service checks overhead, uh, you know, windows uh, and, and uh, they, they make sure that nobody's in these windows or else the windows are shut, et cetera. And they didn't do that in Dallas. And uh, uh, he goes into a lot of security things that were not done. And, and Palomar goes into what he calls security stripping. They, uh, like Kennedy normally had uh, motorcycles alongside the car. And at the last minute, the night before, the Dallas police said the 
the motorcycle patrolman should be always back of the car. And then another thing that was really important was there was a flatbed truck that preceded the Kennedy car in most motorcades and press photographers and film, you know, guys with movie cameras were on the truck. And uh, it, there was a truck like that at Love Field and it was uh, not, a, didn't make it into the motorcade because Roger Warner and another agent uh, changed all the numbers. They had numbers, uh, you know, little cards on the windshields of each vehicle and they took the number off or, or put it way back in the motorcade and never got into the motorcade. So that's why we don't have as much professional photography coverage as you would normally of a presidential trip. So the amateurs were the ones who covered it very well. And editor and publisher, I found November 30th, wrote a piece of sort of ridiculing the amateur photographers for being out of focus and blurry. And But they did a great job, actually. There were about 20 people who, uh, well, they were, they were a lot of people took still pictures, but there are uh, at least 10 or 12 people who took motion pictures uh, beyond, including Zapruder, but other people. But um, James Alkins, the AP photographer with uncanny prescience, I don't think it's suspicious, but he positioned himself at exactly the spot where Kennedy was shot. And he got that really terrific panoramic shot, which may show Oswald in, in the doorway too. Oh, that's a big controversy. And, but then he he said he um, changed focus and he he was panned over to get a shot of Kennedy as he as he drove past him. And then he froze when he heard the gunshot and he didn't take the picture. Uh, but he was there. Uh, they, he tried to go on the uh, railroad bridge and they told him he couldn't go there. You know, because that's another thing. You're not supposed to have people on railroad bridges when the president passes under them, but they had some civilians there, you know, railroad, railroad workers and, and policemen. And uh, that, uh, and that was suspicious too. You know? Do you think that technology helps in a situation? Oh, sorry, Joe, you go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to, I wanted to ask Richard a quick question because does Evica talk about the fact that Connolly ends up as Nixon's treasury secretary? Um, no, because in that in that workshop, he's focused solely on how you know, that when, when you have a conspiracy and you have a kill zone, your job, one of the jobs, one of the most important jobs is to get your target into that kill zone. And the whole presentation starts with Connolly uh, getting that assignment and how he arm twisted and used his power as governor to uh, get that target into that kill zone. And it's fascinating to me. I read what he said uh, af after he was uh, shot. My God, they're going to kill us all, according to Nancy Connolly, is what he said. Uh, not everybody in the car, not everybody in the motorcade, they're going to kill us, all of us conspirators. My God, they're going to kill us all. He also uh -huh. was at the meeting, and it was June fifth in um, somewhere in Texas, I forget which city, where Connolly met with uh, Johnson and Kennedy uh, when Kennedy was making a visit. That's where they decided he would come to Dallas in November. There was some talk about coming in August. I guess Johnson's birthday was in August or whatever. But they were gonna they they, they settled on November, and uh, people at the White House around Kennedy said, "Boy, uh, Connolly is really insistent that." Kennedy come to Dallas and uh, and, and in the uh, November 14th meeting, they said Connolly is really giving us a hard time. We got to have this trip. And he also went to the Oval Office in October 63 to tell Kennedy, you got to really come to Dallas, et cetera. So he was the prime mover in getting him to Dallas. And uh, yeah, Evica goes into all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the moment that the uh, date was established and Evica develops this very early on because a, a lot of the a lot of the debunking has to do with the fact that it couldn't be a conspiracy because Oswald didn't know until very shortly before that he was going to come he was told by somebody that he was arriving and he didn't know what the route was going to be until like a couple of days no 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 none of that's true there was a uh, there's, there's a group in Texas, the, the Sons of the Republic of Texas, 
Um, and uh, they meet every year on the anniversary of the Battle of San Jacinto. You have to be a descendant of uh, the Texas Revolution period in order to get into the Sons of the Revolution. There's also a Daughters of the Revolution. But there's a subset of the Sons of the Revolution that uh, is called the Knights of San Jacinto. And Jack Valenti, who was John Conley's good pal at the time, was in the Sons, uh, was in the, the Sons and in the Knights of San Jacinto. It was at that meeting in April of 63 that they decided that they were going to ask Kennedy, they we're going to give a, we're going to give an, a, a dinner honoring um, Albert Thomas, the congressman, who was a good friend of Kennedy's. And they knew that if they had this dinner for him, honoring him, Kennedy would not be able to refuse because they were such good friends. He liked him so much. They set the dinner in Houston on November 21st of that year. This was done in April. That date never changed. It later kindly developed it into a three-day trip uh, because he had to. Thomas was dying dying at the time, too. That was one reason Kennedy came right. to Texas to honor him at, uh, at this uh, dinner, as you said, and it became a two-day trip, as you said. But he also went to San Antonio, Joe's, Joe's uh, stomping around, sir. Yeah. yeah I it was a, have a it, photograph of Kennedy uh, in San Antonio that a friend of mine's father took from his visit to San Antonio. So it's, a, it's a cool photograph that nobody's ever seen. I did some research on the Houston trip and, and the police chief in Houston. I went down there and I, I looked in the morgue of the newspapers and I found interesting stories. The police chief said I was terrified all the way through the trip that somebody was going to kill Kennedy. He said this afterwards. And uh, George H.W. Bush had this guy, James Parrott, who was the head of the Young Republicans in Houston, which is where uh, Bush, that's that was his headquarters. And he was the head of the uh, the the uh, uh, Republican Party there, and he's also running for governor. And um, I'm sorry, he was running for the uh, Congress. That's right. Uh, but anyway, James Parrott was this uh, young nut in his uh, office. And about an hour after the assassination, Bush called the FBI and said, uh, James Parrott has been talking about killing the president when he comes to Dallas. And the immediate question is like, well, if somebody's been doing that, why didn't you call the Secret Service beforehand? That's what I would do. But Bush waits till he gets shot. And then they went out to find Parrot and they found him with his mother and they said he had an alibi. And the story sort of blew over, they claimed. But I found that the FBI did a six month investigation of Parrot and his right wing friends in Dallas and Houston. He was connected with some extreme right wingers who were. Uh, very violently anti-Kennedy and I guess the United Nations and things. And uh, this report was um, removed from the National Archives shortly after Bush became vice president. But I got some pages from it from a house uh, uh, aide who has worked on the HSCA. And I wrote about that in my book. And I, I found FBI documents about this investigation. The FBI took it seriously. The parrot was mixed up with some really insane people. And uh, so, but, and that's one reason they were worried when Kennedy had a, a long motorcade through uh, Houston and uh, he arrived that night in the rain and Kennedy made comments to his wife and other people that that would have been a great night to kill a president, you know, in the rain, have somebody jostle us with, jostle me with a uh, weapon inside a briefcase and you could kill, kill a president. He mentioned that again the next day. He, he seemed to know he was a marked man. There was also that famous tape by Joseph Miltier, who was a uh, right wing uh, uh, segregationist who, who told an informant in Miami uh, that there was a plot underway to kill the president uh, from from a high powered uh, with a high powered gun from an office window and Kennedy knows he's a marked man and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it was very, very explicit. And then, so the Miami motorcade was canceled. They, they helicoptered him to his uh, site where he spoke. And there was a, apparently a plot in Tampa as well, you know, uh, during that part of the trip. 
But Dallas was the perfect place where all these, you know, Johnson kind of could control everybody. You know, Wade was a, an old uh, colleague of his and uh, he had all kinds of connections with um, uh, all, all the legal and uh, police people and, and, and the government people in Texas. And so that was the ideal location. On the other hand, it exposed the Texas connection pretty prominently and caused people to speculate was Johnson involved. And, and uh, that's a whole other story. But, you know, uh, uh, if he'd been shot in Chicago, it would have been a different matter. Uh, but they, they, they knew they could succeed in Dallas, I guess. I don't think Johnson uh, knew the details of the conspiracy leading up to the assassination. He was aware. I think he was aware that it was going to happen. But he, his role comes after the assassination. I've tried to do this thought experiment. Could you have even accomplished the assassination? Would you have even wanted to accomplish the assassination if Johnson wasn't the vice president? Yeah. I don't see any even way. Castro. It and so he had to have plausible deniability because they knew he was going to take over and control everything after uh, with his power. Um, so I think he, he was aware vaguely, but he wasn't brought into because of plausible deniability. Connolly, however, different. Connolly was a direct conspirator forcing the route and the, the selection of the trademark and all of that. And Evica does a brilliant job developing all yeah. that. Hmm. Yeah, that's the big question which, which researchers ponder, but they haven't pondered it enough. Was Johnson aware of it or was he uh, there's, there seems to be a barrier. People don't want to admit that he was the mastermind. That word comes up, mastermind. It was probably the plot was germinated at a lower level, but Johnson was probably aware of it and read into it in, in some way, uh, prepared for it. You know, he he also, you know, when you read Caro's book, uh, Caro buys the whole theory of young blood jumping over the seat and all. He makes a huge thing of it. It just didn't happen. I was very disappointed by that volume because his other volumes on Johnson are good. But um, <clears throat> Johnson, he talks about how calm he was and how, how uh, extremely uh, efficient he was in the aftermath. Although there is some disagreement that um, Kennedy's doctor, Admiral Berkeley, said he found Johnson in the bathroom on Air Force One uh, crying and whimpering, uh, they're going to kill us all. And, uh, you know, he said he had to slap him. That's an amazing thing. Berkeley wouldn't speak to the House Select Committee. He he put out a comment that, you know, I know a lot of things I could tell you, but you know, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk to you. My very first published uh, article on the assassination in Jerry Rose's third decade was called The Late Arrival of George Berkeley. Um, he was one of the guys who was put way back at the end of the motorcade in the press bus. Kennedy's personal physician. And what I, what I developed in that essay was the fact that he was, you know, uh, Kennedy had an adrenal deficiency. It wasn't Addison's disease, as you popularly hear, but he had an adrenal deficiency. I found out that if you have that adrenal deficiency and you experience any trauma at all, as you like cut your hand or anything, you have to be given cortisone in the emergency room just to survive. So they didn't take any chances. They, and they knew this about Kennedy. The conspirators knew this about Kennedy. All they had to do was wing him and prevent the one guy there who knew about the cortisone shot to not be able to get there in time. So they didn't take any chances at all. They didn't have to, to blow his head off. They didn't have to have a kill shot. All they had to do was give him enough trauma and prevent him from getting the cortisone in the emergency room. And that's why they had to put Berkeley back in the, in the VIP bus at the end of the motorcade. I think he arrived about 1245 or 1240. Uh, Kennedy came to Parkland at 1234. Uh, normally he, he actually rode in the presidential limousine quite often or in the follow-up car. My mother was in a motorcade with Kennedy in 1962. She was vice chairman of the Wisconsin Democratic Party and she helped organize a motorcade in Milwaukee. And she was riding in a car with Berkeley and Mrs. Lincoln, Evelyn Lincoln, Kennedy's secretary. But they were, they were not that close to the president in that uh, motorcade. 
she made an illusion uh, that the Secret Service was very difficult to deal with on the trip, and I wish I had asked her what what, what was it, you know, because she helped arrange the local aspects of it in collaboration with the Secret Service. But yeah, Berkeley is an interesting figure, isn't he? Yeah. Well, coming Before, up, uh, Joe Green say something. He was going to say yeah. something. Uh, what was I going to say? I don't remember. Well, coming oh, up on the think of something new. I think it's something pithy, yeah. No, I just, I'm having a, a great time talking about this. This is uh... Berkeley signed a, uh, the death certificate and he located the, um, uh, the back wound in its correct position. If there was a back wound, some people even question, was there a back wound or was that an artifact? But he, you know, Gerald Ford moved the back wound up from the shoulder to the back of the neck. And you can find, uh, you can look online and you can see the page of the draft Warren report where Gerald Ford writes handwriting and changes it to from the right shoulder to the back of the neck to make the single bullet theory possible, even though it was invented by our own inspector. Well, um, coming up on the two hour mark, is there any final thoughts that you guys have on anything that you feel like need to be addressed? I this do. was great, Bobby. Huh? It's Go ahead, Joe. Read, read these books. Wait, did he so, offer, did he offer me a compliment and I didn't hear it? What'd you say? <laughs> I, I, listen, this listen is, to Robbie. This yeah. is and there, this is very significant for me personally that you just kind of happened to put this together. But this would have been my dream panel oh. because, and I don't know if, if Joseph McBride knows this, but um, you were you were my uh, crossing of the Rubicon. Your article in The Nation about Mr. George Bush of the CIA was that moment when I went from casual interest in the assassination, which I'd always had since I was seven years old at the time. You were 14. We're in the same generation in that respect. And you and I both experienced it, the only ones on this panel. But, you know, you wait and you wait and you wait. And you have all the investigations and things are happening. And you have you keep a casual interest in it, but eventually something happens. And when I read your article about Mr. George Bush of the CIA, and at the moment he was about to become president, this was September um, of '88, and it was I already knew at that time that he was going to be the next president. And when I realized that he was that involved, and he was CIA at the time of the Kennedy assassination. It hit me like a ton of bricks that uh, the, the coup succeeded. And I said, all right, I've developed an informed opinion about any number of things over my lifetime. I have yet to develop an informed opinion about this. So I, I started my serious um, scholarship spurred by your article. So you, you, uh, you built the bridge that got me to this point that I had to cross. To that wasn't a point. compliment to me at all. Joe, damn. Joe Green. <laughs> no, you put this panel together. Joe Green is the other bookend of my entire research career. He's the guy who published the result of what began with Joe McBride. I'll just let myself out. Thank you. <laughs> And Joe's books. I will are... remember you, Robbie, for this. Well, I, I this is this is my second panel, but also there are people that couldn't be here that wanted to also be a part of this. That I'm going to do a third one. If you guys are also interested, I send the invitation out to you. Um, there are names I need to get in here. Gary Aguilar is one. Um, Vince is one as well too. Um, a bunch of other people um, that I know. I'll just talk to Joe uh, Green about it um, to make sure that to verify if they're okay or everyone kind of agrees. I don't want to get a bunch of people fighting and stuff, but a bigger panel, hopefully the goal is just to do bigger than what the first panel was, which there was six people. I want to do a total of eight and you guys are all invited. I appreciate you guys giving me uh, your time to be able to talk about this. And I know I get some things wrong and I'm glad you guys are there to correct me on it as well too, to make sure I'm getting the information because at a slow pace, I'm getting there. I'm trying to consume it all, but it's a lot. And um, it's definitely something that I really when I see people talk about it, it sparks up interest in me also to want to jump in and say some things, not fight, but just talk about it as well, too. 
but also that can be dangerous when it comes to if you're on the forums, if you're on anything, um, there's a lot of people out there that are just kind of sowing seeds of misinformation or just doubt and in, in certain things. And I, I think this is a topic that the reason why a lot of people can connect to it is because at any moment, if we would have been in a position like Kennedy, um, that could have easily happened to us. And there's not really a scenario or a thing that could be like, oh, well, it wouldn't happen to me. No, at any moment, your life could be as sensitive as that. And it could be a situation as that. And the worst thing in the world is that it, the death or the assassination or all these things, these pieces that are missing, these pieces that are confused, it really kind of spits um, on top of the whole situation. And I think that the best thing that I want to see happen i'm sure you guys have spent long trying to figure this out and want this to happen as well too which is clarity on the case um whether it's with your side or not you just want to know 100 percent what the truth is what is being held um because i mean the truth is should be for everyone you know it's not something that should be kept by secret elites or secret power groups it shouldn't be like that at all and i think um with as much time has passed it really every moment that kind of or every day that kind of goes afterwards is a moment that you're not getting back. It's I mean, this we talk about the Secret Service members when I figure out how many people of them are dead compared to the ones that are still alive today. And it's just like this aspect of like, do you want that to all be like 100 years from now and we get the answers the thing? I mean, you're not getting Jackie Kennedy's dress until like 2100. So I'm just saying that's off the table, but we can still get the rest of the documents at least. Well, look at the Lincoln assassination, which I was interested in before the Kennedy assassination. Uh, uh, that we still don't really know exactly what happened there, and, and unfortunately, it wasn't investigated properly, and there weren't the civilian investigators on the case like there are now. I think one thing it's great that uh, Robbie, you're 24 years old, I believe, and you're you're very knowledgeable and interested. And I, I was mentioning that my students are very open-minded. You know that the people in your generation are willing to listen, unlike people in my baby boomer generation uh, would get really uptight when I would say- uh, There's the conspiracy. compliment. Yeah, they, but you know, those <laughs> we, we lived under the uh, shadow of all that propaganda and you guys I think are more skeptical and you haven't had you know Time Magazine breathing down your neck for 50 years. So I think it's a really good sign that young people are into it. And when I, I started my book, Political Truth, uh, the media and the assassination of President Kennedy by talking about it, a college friend of mine, my age, who, who uh, she and I were exchanging some information when I, I had my book Into the Nightmare and, I, and she said she wouldn't read it. And she, she said, um, why are you still interested in that case? Why are you not interested in some contemporary political issues? And I wrote back, this is a contemporary political issue. And then I never heard from her again until oddly enough, after this other book came out, she sent me an email. She didn't mention our Kennedy stuff, but I, I didn't reply. But, you know, this is a contemporary political issue. This is this profoundly changed America and it led to this ter terrible schism and crisis in our democracy that we have today. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's so it's great that young people are, are picking up the ball and it's not something that people have forgotten or don't care about anymore. I think they do care, but they need to be taught about it. And I try to teach them in my classes. And I was a volunteer for JFK. The picture behind me there is a picture I took in 1960 in Wisconsin. I was a volunteer. So I feel I'm kind of carrying his uh, torch, uh, you know, do, uh, following his path to try to solve his murder. The candidate I supported was murdered. It changed my whole view of America. And I lost my faith in the political system, but I've been studying this case ever since. I wrote a, a, a short story about his assassination in 1961 for my freshman English class. I was worried about it even then, so I was not totally surprised when he was killed. And uh, But um, it's good to hear that Rich uh, was influenced by my Bush stuff. I've been very influenced by you guys. Uh, you're both terrific researchers. And Joe writes some amazingly philosophical pieces putting the whole thing in a wider context which is really important to do too and where can people find joe green you go first with your links rich you go second and then we'll end it with joe mcbride okay well joe green jfk is always the the quickest place and uh, also the hidden history center and uh, say something they'll press uh, rich 
July, let me add something to Joe's. <laughs> oh my July God, 15th. he's showing his book. No, no, this is a play that oh, Joe wrote. Mine. Einstein's wrong about everything. I want an it's autographed my copy. Play. My favorite play that he wrote. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, this is an autographed copy. Yeah. I want But uh, it's going to be uh, produced for the first time in San Antonio on uh, July 15th. I won't be able to make it, Joe, because I got other things going on, but um, I, I would really like to. And um, well, it's going to so be yeah. on for about uh, three, four weeks, I think. I, think. I don't know how many performances they're going to do, actually. That's a good question. I would love to do a few. Would, so, yeah, so my book, um, The Deep. Um, the Deep State in the Heart of Texas. You can get it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, well, as I said in my one-on-one -on -one with Robbie, um, if you do um, at Bartholomew Views, V I E W S instead of Bartholomew, um, you can find uh, just about everything about me, even some JFK stuff, because a lot of people would link to my cartoons in the old days from that. But if you also do Richard Bartholomew JFK. Uh, just use the search engine. Uh, uh, I gave up on websites long ago because they kept getting eaten by nefarious forces. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm very searchable. Uh, Is your piece on the, the car connected with the assassination? I, I downloaded that from the internet at some point. Is that available on the internet? Yeah, yeah. That was uh, uh, my first major uh, monograph. Um, I self-published it in 1993. And uh, sort of circulating pretty widely in 94. And um, I, um, I ended up uh, getting a great compliment from John Judge in a, a speech he gave that's on, the, it's on YouTube where uh, he, uh, he mentions that monograph. And it's a, a 1994 speech he gave. Um, but no, it's in the book. So we put it in the book. Uh, there's two, two long monographs in the book. Uh, we started out with the one that came after it, so they're out of chronological order, but it's more pertinent to the facts of the assassination. It's about the ballistics called the gun that didn't smoke, uh, then followed, followed by possible discovery of an automobile used in the JFK conspiracy, and then shorter essays after that. And you don't have to read the book from front to back. You can skip around. You can read essays. They're standalone essays. Uh, there's one on the Zapruder film. If you haven't read it, you'll find it very interesting. Uh, I'm not an agnostic like you, Joe McBride. I'm not an agnostic. The, the Warren, the the uh, the Warren Commission hid the fact that the that the Zapruder film was fake. Uh, well, I used to be an agnostic, but I have been converted to believing. I used uh, to be. I yeah. used to be an agnostic too. But yeah, the facts the flat facts show it. Um, but anyway, so, so that's my uh, that's my spiel. Yeah, that's a terrific book and, and a really valuable. I remember Penn Jones's wife, Elaine Jones, who's a good researcher, told me about your Rambler article when I was in Texas researching the case in 93. Wait, she, she told you? Yeah, Elaine Jones, Penn Jones's uh, uh, wife. Oh, right, 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 right. She said this great she article. You got to gotta get this piece. It's just mind blowing. And it really I, is. I've never heard that. Nobody okay, that's it. pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it really is, you know, I mean, this is such a complex case. Uh, so many leads and tentacles, uh, as Nixon said, it's not something we're involved with except through contracts and connections. I guess you know, there are many contracts and connections in this case. You, tr you trace one, you know, Penn Jones gave me the advice he gave other people too. He said, pick one aspect of the assassination, one that hasn't been researched properly and research the hell out of it. So I thought, okay, the Tippett case has been neglected. So I, I researched the hell out of that in my book, Into the Nightmare, my search for the killers of President John F. Kennedy and Officer J.D. Tippett, which you can get online uh, through Amazon exclusively. And it keeps selling. People around the world keep buying it. It's, it's very gratifying. And then uh, my recent book, Political Truth, the Media and the Assassination of President Kennedy, also out on Amazon. That was, I was, I kept thinking when I did Into the Nightmare, which took 30 years to write, that I should have a chapter in the media. And I just couldn't fit it in because it was such a big topic. I realized it needed a whole book. I did a chapter on the four day docudrama on television, which was kind of revisionist way of looking at what people thought was a triumph of television, but it was actually a triumph of propaganda. 
but then I did, I started working on the, the media case uh, seriously in the 90s. And I brought it to fruition just recently. So those are my two books on the case. And thanks everyone for joining me on this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. And stay tuned for another episode.